Shalom and good evening. Um, I We went a different way last night, and well, I want to wish you a happy Purim, uh, which is uh, uh, the holiday we the Jewish people celebrate for... Uh, uh, for uh, commemorating, of course, Esther and uh, the the Book of Esther and the triumph there, I just want to tonight uh, come on briefly to uh, let you know that uh, last night we I was going to do uh, kind of like a service. We had some music, and then it just ended up being a I don't know what you want to call it, jam session. We were with friends, and they wanted to just do that, so. I said, okay, but I think it's important that I, this is not an official, <laughs> I guess, um, you know, our Monday, Wednesday, Friday or whatever, you know, we're doing now, but, um, uh, oh yes, I'm Rabbi Maurice Sklar and uh, this, welcome to our evening uh, time. I just want to read some summaries to you and share a little bit about uh, for, first of all, we uh, there have been a lot of curveballs, if you will. The things have gone different directions uh, as far as I couldn't uh, share with you this week's parasha. And I want to do that. Or oh, That's the passage from from the Hebrew that uh, that is read in the synagogues and uh, from the Torah. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about Purim. And uh, we just, I'm not going to stay on super long, I don't think, tonight, because I actually wasn't, my, I wasn't feeling well today again. This medicine is, is crazy, uh, you know, because I have to take this medicine to lower my blood pressure. And so I'm just really contending for my energy level more than anything. But at least, hallelujah, I'm on my way and I just believe God's going to, give us a miracle and give me us well me and you as well because but anyway what i want to do is just talk to you a little bit since i didn't want another i didn't want the week to go by this was from last weekend the the uh, portion oh it's all all of this week and i just felt the lord say at least just share what uh you know what we usually do i read uh, a summary here it's uh Wonderful! It's uh, you can find it actually uh, 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 on it's a website called HebrewForChristians dot com, but it, it's so well written and uh, so concise. I couldn't do it any better. So, <laughs> well, so without further ado, I'm just going to do that right now, and we're going to look at uh, um, this week's parasha, which started, of course, uh, last. Uh, uh, Friday night and goes through until tomorrow. <laughs> Little behind. But, uh, and of course we have the Feast of Purim, which is tonight and tomorrow, or starting now, actually. So so this is uh, called Tetzavi, or Tetzava. You shall command. And so... Tetzavi is the second person in perfect of Tzava, meaning to command, mitzvah. And this reading begins with God telling Moses to command the children of Israel to provide pure olive oil to feed the everlasting flame of the menorah. Of course, it's in the, in the uh, temple. The priestly garments worn by the Kohanim, or the the Levites, the priests, while serving in the sanctuary or the holy place there, is, are also described in this Torah portion. So this uh, passage, which is actually the, it's Exodus 27, verse 20 through Exodus 30, verse 10. So that's tonight's, uh, or uh, this week's uh, reading. And of course, tomorrow, well, <laughs> I'm just getting in the tail end of the week here, but Hallelujah. It's better than not doing it, right? I want to honor the Lord. And he said to, to, you know, he said, go on. I had a little energy, like I said. So this portion begins, and these, this is the actual Hebrew. So we'll listen to that. All right. 
There we go. Amen. So, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn. That's Exodus 27, verse 20. So that's how, uh, from last week, and this is how the portion begins. According to Jewish tradition, only the first few drops of the oil uh, pressed from an olive were to be used for the menorah, since these were considered the first fruits of the olives and also the brightest of oils. Of course, there was no electricity in those days, or and uh, the olive oil was a uh, uh, was really uh, how you could see anything at night. But of course, in the in a closed building, uh, the menorah was what lit the uh, the the holy place, which is where uh, in the first covenant we we ministered, or the priests, I should say, the, we ministered to the Lord, and then of course. The Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant was, and and that was, you had better go in there a very special way, only on Yom Kippur, but you understand. So <clears throat> anyway, so this is talking about this uh, special, special oil. Every morning, the priest would enter the Kodesh, or the Holy Place section of the Mishkan, to empty the ashes from the lamps and insert new wicks. See, there was a, there was a, this was not to go out. It was a, uh, it was to always light, illuminate. Of course, that has a lot of spiritual meanings as well. I mean, we, we, we see all through the, uh, the old covenant, we see pictures and types and shadows of Messiah. In so many ways, Yeshua or Jesus is uh, shown to our people, it's so shown to Israel, that I am sending a redeemer. I am sending the light of the world. And so, of course, there's two, uh, uh, there are not, there's two uh, times we celebrate in the year, in the Jewish year, and one of them, of course, was Hanukkah, just, we just passed, which is the last in our calendar year here. Uh, you know, in December. And then the first of the celebrations uh, is the uh, uh, is Purim, which is one of the happiest times because uh, it's one of the few times in our history <laughs> that uh, we actually experienced victory over our enemies. And of course, the story of Haman and Esther is, uh, is read every year at this time as well. So anyway, so these uh these lights were are were serviced and um the uh now however the midrash or the teachings the Jewish teachings says that the westernmost light or the Nur Ma'aravi would remain burning which was then used to light the other six lamps similar to the way the shamash candle is used to light the other candles at Hanukkah. Only after the other lamps were lit would he blow out the Ner Ma'arivi and clear its ashes and rekindle it. Okay, so that's uh, that's some detail about uh, really uh, what, uh, and this was very important uh, at that time because uh, this was, of course, the 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 temple was the place, and of course, originally the tabernacle of Moses, and then of course the temple. Uh, but in the time of the Torah, it this was the the place where God chose to abide, and so it was something that He had made certain rules to, under the uh, first covenant that that's is how you approach God. So you, and then there's many many things that uh, actually are represented. In fact, there is a holy menorah in the temple in heaven. 
And you have to remember the temples that, that God told us to, <clears throat> first Israel to build, and then of course, we're going to see, uh, we're going, we, we've had three uh, in Jerusalem. There's, uh, sorry, two. There's another one that's coming, uh, which will be what I call the tribulation temple. I don't believe God will build this one, but they're ready to do it. And uh, of course, the Jews want to. Uh, I've got everything ready, and the Bible says that during the uh, uh, 70th week of Daniel, there'll be a, another desecration by what we call the anti-Messiah, or the, the this world leader, that will uh, rise up as, a, as the worst of dictators, and he will do what happened uh, in the second temple, which was the desecration, or what... It's called the abomination of desolation. A, a pig was sacrificed, and I mean, it's, it's a horrible thing. And the great tragedy of the the destruction of the temple, seventy, uh, we they say we say BCE <laughs> or AD um, in our calendar that that was the a terrible tragedy of losing our temple, and then the 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 this, this, the taking over of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the uh, dispersion or the exile of our people, which has happened. And uh, it hasn't, it was 1967, actually, where uh, for the first time, during the first time, Jerusalem was uh, God uh, through a just miracle and through different series, I mean, not only, of course, 48 was the birth of, of the nation of Israel, the rebirth, which is the greatest miracle, the greatest miracle proving that this book, the Word of God, I have different Bibles, this, is, this Bible I have right now, that this is truly the Word of God because it predicts the future with 100% accuracy. The, the Torah says it in every prophet nearly, I think, Every Old Testament prophet also says, and Yeshua said as well, uh, that uh, the the Jewish people would be scattered and dispersed to the very ends of the earth. And but in the latter days, or the last times, or the time before the coming of Mashiach or Messiah, we would see a miraculous rebirth and. Sure enough, it happened. Well, then in 67, 1967, there was the uh, Jerusalem for the first time was in all that, all those 2,000 years was given back uh, to uh, the nation of Israel and was no longer, uh, uh, no longer uh, uh, taken by uh, other Gentile nations. So, it was a huge thing, and that also is prophesied again before. So we know the season, the time of the coming of Messiah for our people. The what the church calls the uh, uh, is is the coming of our Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. Hallelujah, and he's he's going, and he's bringing the kingdom with him. So the kingdom has been preached through, through uh, in Yeshua's name and the new covenant. We've, we've preached it, we're supposed to at least, for the last 2,000 years. We're pre this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then the end will come, right? So this end involves very uh, specific uh, prophecies concerning the final seven years. And, and what I believe... Uh, is the grand finale that follow, that that precedes it? What I call the grand finale is the great outpouring of grace and goodness uh, to bring uh, the nations and all who will hear uh, to uh, to the Lord, because God does not want anyone to perish. Uh, God's will is that none perish, but all come to repentance and receive be born again, receive Jesus as Lord. Amen. So this, that's the time we're in now, the great harvest. So anyway, so we're, so this, there's a, you know, there's a, 
quite a bit of detail, and uh, there was a lot of uh, priestly laws that are not in effect after, of course, the resurrection of our Messiah. You, uh, but these were the ways that we had to approach a holy God before uh, God could live not in temples made with hands anymore, but in, he said, oh, the new covenant I'll make with Israel and Judah, he says in the, in the prophets, is, is uh, he says, I'm going, not going to live in a building made with hands. God moved out of that temple, if you will. It says the veil, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil or that, that uh, curtain is a very thick curtain that separated the holy place where this menorah uh, is and was, and and uh, and the holy of holies. You could only go in there once a year, and that with the blood of an animal. And it was very. I'm telling you what. If you went in the wrong way, they put a rope on, and only the high priest. That's it. Only one could go in, and uh, believe me, he made sure he did it right because uh, they would put a rope on him. Uh, in case uh, he said, because if he, if he if he didn't do it the right way, the 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 Shekinah, the presence of God would absolutely just it just he a man could not live in the glory of God without the blood on the mercy seat. Well, that's all showing uh, the story of Jesus who became and is the Lamb of God and the soon coming King. So this all here um, is, you know, when you look at it from the illumination, if you will, of the new covenant, we realize, wow, this is all talking about uh, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. So there was a specific way you had to light these, these uh, the seven uh, oil lamps, right? Okay, on the so all Kohanim or the regular priests wore, and then the, these are the uh, oh sorry, so these are the sacred garments. Yeah, so so this this is there's a passage here. It talks about exactly how to make them, what material they are. They and you only you wore these clothes when you went in there, and then when you left, you took them off. You had to wash them. It was it was to separate to teach us to separate the holy, that God is holy, uh, from, the, um, from the everyday. And that's, uh, that's what's involved. It's our heart also. But God said, I'll dwell in, in uh, I won't dwell in a building anymore. I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. They shall be my God. Uh, I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I shall be their God. They shall be my people. And that's always in God's desire that he may dwell with us, to, to be one with us. And, and so thank God for the new birth. I talk about that a lot. So these uh, sacred garments, uh, there, was, there were certain rules. Only the descendants of Aaron were allowed to wear these priestly garments. Um, a Levite, a regular Israel, Israelite could not do so. See, there, there's also, there was a genealogy in, uh, in the Levitical line of the direct children of Abraham, which uh, actually now in modern times, they have genetically, or the DNA, they, there's an actual, still a distinctive mark to know that if someone is uh, what they they call a Kohanim or a, a natural descendant of this high priestly line. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, they're extra special. Or they, no, but there is a chosenness and there was a purpose and God has even extended that. That's a miracle that we could even know after 2,000 years, 3,000 years, 4,000, you know, whatever. 4, since the time of, of the writing of the ancient Israel, you know, the, in the in the Exodus here, in the uh, uh, Torah, we we actually we can say, well, this person we know by their DNA. We know this one is a Kohanim. This is a descendant of that high priestly line, and so that's a that's a very special distinction. Um, I 
I have not gotten that to, I don't know. It doesn't matter so much because it doesn't matter now in the same way because, of course, we're very quick to say as Christians, well, that doesn't matter. Uh, we are now, uh, we're new creations. We're, we're, we are born from above. We are brand new. We're now sons and daughters of God, not just servants of God, uh, and we're spiritually alive. That's the great, great, shift and the that's why it's a better covenant based on better promises and and uh, you can read all about it in the letters of Paul and in Peter and you know in the gospels as uh, we see in John uh, hints of that we see in the book of Acts that shift and transformation that took place when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost but I'm very quick to say this and God has sort of given me a this <clears throat> emphasis or job, if you will, is to is to say just because the new is greater and it is uh, vital and important, it does not negate what God promised in the everlasting covenant of the first covenant of Abraham. So certain things pass through and they are many things. And there are a lot of things in the Torah that haven't happened. Prophecy, prophecy, uh, and 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 in the prophets, uh, <clears throat> the whole end of the book of Isaiah talks about this time of the wonderful. I mean, Isaiah forty through sixty six is talking about the restoration of end time Israel, a natural Israel, the the uh, the uh, and the millennium, and the wonderful when Messiah Mashiach is coming, and we believe that as the, both the Jews and the Christians believe. We believe. And we know, and, and the sages are, you know, the, uh, we know by the signs of the times. You know, we know because ever, it's, we know the convergence of these things. And <clears throat> that's why I can say to you confidently that uh, we are very close uh, to this, uh, all these end time prophecies, the judgments of God, and of course, the the great hope, our transfer, our our uh, uh, catching away, the 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 um, <clears throat> the uh, we shall be changed, <laughs> the uh, the the where we meet Messiah in the air and we are changed. So these are all <clears throat> the things that I, the Lord has called me to. But I'm very quick to say, don't try to erase and replace. Israel, because <clears throat> that's a mistake that the church has made more than a mistake. It's been a, a it's been a great tragedy. Actually, we <clears throat> we did not from about mm, about since Constantine, really about three hundred A.D. something like that. Uh, there was and there was a lot with the church fathers. They call them. They wrote a lot of anti-Semitic things, saying, "Well, we are now." replacing all of those promises no longer apply and that is not so they don't they still apply to the natural family of abraham the through isaac and jacob those things can exist and be fulfilled and i'm you know god's called me to be like a, a to trumpet that emphasize that look from this perspective of the mountain and say you know what god's not done yet <laughs> and the fulfillment of the promises in the old are absolutely essential and, in fact, qualify the fullness in the new. Or as uh, one time, I, I've said it many times, but uh, I try to tell the Christians, bless their heart, we've, you know, uh, and, our, our, and I am a Christian, I mean, or I'm a believer, of course, I'm not... I have to stand in both worlds. It's a tough job. Somebody's got to do it. But, uh, <laughs> well, how can you do that? You can't, oh, yeah, you're not under law. You're under grace. Yes and no. And no and yes. <laughs> uh, I don't have time to get into all that right now, except to say uh, there isn't a, a, a ladder of worthiness. You can't make yourself, you cannot you cannot 
achieve perfection through the outward observance of the law. You cannot do it. It, it, it because the standard is God himself, which is absolute perfection. So <clears throat> we need a mediator. We must be born again, <clears throat> Jew and Gentile. So it does change a lot of things. But the kingdom that's coming is actually a restoration on the fulfillment of the promises made to natural Israel. And so what I say is this, uh, I know, I know we've been, we've been, uh, you know, running with the baton, if you will, <clears throat> as the Gentile nations, a church for 1700 years or so, or a little more, a little less. <clears throat> as far as the, yeah, when we were dispersed, we, we, you know, but then a time shifted, even at the end of this grace time, where God begins, the fig tree begins to blossom. That's how Jesus uh, sy symbolized that, one of the things it means uh, in that, in Matthew 24. <clears throat> when you see the fulfillment of the ancient promises, God began to turn his attention back to his first covenant people, then you'll know. He said, when you see the fig tree blossom and the, you know, spring is coming, it begins to sprout, you begin to see new life, you begin to see the blessing of God, that's a herald to the coming kingdom. The kingdom of God shall be restored to Israel. That was the last thing that uh, the, the disciples asked him before in Acts chapter 1, I think it's verse 8, he said, well, the last thing they asked him was, Yeshua, Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That was the last thing they asked him. I mean, it must have been important. They know he's about to ascend. He bodily ascended to heaven. Hallelujah. Uh, and uh, uh, he was raptured, if you will. In his body, he was taken out of this earth and they watched him he said i'm going to come just like with the clouds in other words there were a lot with him that would that doesn't mean um with uh, uh you know what do you call those you know just different not literal clouds like we see in the sky that's that's a cloud of witnesses it's a cloud he shall come <laughs> he shall come he left he left with uh many of many that he had uh had been born again that he preached to in when in those three days and nights he came and and preached to the 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 uh first covenant old covenant believers who were waiting in a place called paradise he went and he and they were born again they ascended with him in fact it says for 40 days uh even physically when Jesus resurrected Many of the, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, whoever it was, Lazarus, come by, many of the, just the, the, those that were waiting for Messiah were actually, when he, Jesus resurrected, there was some that came and preached. You just, you pass right by that if you don't, if you don't read closely in the Gospels, but you can, you can see that, uh, this was, uh, there was a physical part of this, uh, well, so in the same way that I that the angels said you see him go, the same way he left, Jesus, that's the way he's going to come. Well, how is he going to come? He's going to come. He's going to come, and we shall be caught up according to uh, uh, Paul's revelation in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. I show you a mystery: you shall be changed in a moment, twinkling an eye. And this corruptible shall be put on in the first resurrection, or the righteous shall be raised. Now, the Jews believe that too. That's why they have all those uh, graves, all of those, and they're right on the Mount of Olives. I mean, it's packed. It's absolutely packed. We go every, uh, every time we, uh, with uh, Governor Huckabee, we go to, uh, <clears throat> we go to uh, Oscar Schindler's, uh, grave there and uh, I play and he speaks about because of the movie and the you know the, anyway God's faithful <laughs> so all that how did I get over there all right so anyway these are some of the garments let me just go through this um, 
there's a full length tunic or long shirt. Then there's, there are short pants. And they, they said the priests are to wear this when they come and minister in the holy place. Uh, uh, and it has the uh, a band of white linen wound into a pointed turban. So there was something they wore a hat too. And uh, avnet or a very long sash that was wound above the waist. And uh, it was, wow, this avnet or this uh, uh, sash was over 40 feet in length. I did not know that. Wow, that's long. Boy, it's complicated. Aren't you glad we have a new and better covenant? We can boldly approach the throne of grace to receive. Why? God God uh, put away sin, not with the blood of an animal. He didn't just cover it for one year. He blotted out our sins so that he can... He, he's, we're justified not by the blood of goats and animals. We are justified by the precious shed blood of Yeshua, our Messiah. So uh, there's the now they're the high priest, and that's the that's the one that uh, had the work of on the Day of Atonement of going in with the blood. Uh, he wore an ephod, which is an apron-like garment. Tied in the front, it was made of blue and purple and red dyed wool, linen, and gold thread, according to uh, this passage. <laughs> the, uh, there was a breastplate also with a pouch that contained 12 precious stones inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, in the King James, he calls the ephod, which he wore that, the high priest did, and it represented... Uh, and uh, it could be in a pouch. Some people, some people picture it as an actual. Uh, bre the breastplate itself is in the breast. I think it's probably like that. Um, <clears throat> so this breastplate was to he bore, he bore the uh, all twelve tribes on his, on his uh, chest. See that that was, uh, and all that is how the Father sees us. So. Remember, Yeshua, Jesus, is now our forever high priest. So we don't need an earthly Kohen uh, uh, God, uh, Gadol. We don't need the Kohen Adol, which is the, uh, to approach God for us and make an atonement. No, there is a remission through the blood of Jesus, and we can all go directly and have a personal relationship with Messiah, he'd come on the inside of you and live inside of you, not just in, he now, his glory, it says, dwells in the new creation, or the, the that's why, hallelujah, that's important. So Yeshua is now our high priest who shed his own blood, ever lives to make intercession for us, and so he's made the new and living way according to the letter to the Hebrews. Hallelujah. A better way. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anyway, this is all important for us to look at because it shows, as types and shadows, it shows, um, also it shows very clearly how holy God is and how uh, sometimes, you know, 21st century, our generation, uh, seems to not understand. They've forgotten that God is holy. <laughs> but this book, if I take it out here, I mean, if I took it out of the cover, or if I show you another, it says Holy Bible. <laughs> holy Bible. And God is absolutely pure and holy. It's not, he cannot, he cannot, uh, uh, it, the standard is total perfection. So we needed a divine substitute. And that's what our forever high priest Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus, the Lord is. Okay, so um, now there was also uh, not only this ephod with the 12 precious stones uh, representing the 12 tribes, but there was a ma'il, which is a robe of blue wool with golden bells and decorative pomegranates on its hem. You, know, you ever read Anne, you know, a pomegranate, a bell. A pomegranate was on the well. <laughs> that was the garment of the high priest when he went into 
the Holy of Holies. That was a scary thing. I mean, he, he better do it right or that'd be, that's it for him. Pull him out and we got to get a new one. He's, <laughs> I'm sure some didn't do it right and they, they perished. Was it because God was mad at them? No. It's like, it's like if you misuse the laws of electricity, God could not uh, dwell with, uh, with fallen man without a mediator. And this is how he told us in the Torah to approach him. And uh, that's why we had to do that right. And so the high priest was a special, uh, very privileged, special fellow, but he also had a big responsibility. Don't you know he prepared for that? He, he was highly motivated to be able to go in and then actually get out, and not be pulled out <laughs> by the rope. And why did they have those uh, bells on him? The bells, as long as he's moving and alive, those bells are tinkling and the other uh, priests can hear him. Well, he's still going. Okay, he's got it. He's got, all right. He's gonna, but if the bells stop, <laughs> pull him out. Dear Lord, I don't know if I'd want to be the high priest. Would you? Whew. So there was a lot. It was complicated. It was very involved and... Um, this was so that, so that uh, uh, the Holy One of Israel could uh, forgive and cover the sins of his people for a year. And it actually, it's, a, it's almost, it's funny, the way they do it in the fall, or the way it's, uh, the way it, God, the way God set it up, uh, is it's actually a year in advance. God sort of, um, and there's a there's a book that is sealed, you know, and uh, you know uh, the Jews see that as a, you know, we 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 sort of pray through the year in advance and repent in advance, <laughs> and uh, that's why Yom Kippur is a big deal. It's the that that time is is a, a very solemn. And it's a fast time as well. So anyway, all of this is fulfilled in, in him, in our Messiah. So <clears throat> now, uh, now there, this robe, and then there was something on it. Those, there, oh, there's these pomegranates, and those uh, also, all of this has meaning. And in fact, it's even repeated in the epistle book of Hebrews to show that these have uh, all every little detail, every every uh, Hebrew letter uh, in the Torah has uh, huge eternal significance and hidden meanings. And now, the you know the Bible code and codes, and we've all known it. You know, I mean, the the, the rabbis have known that it's there. I, even Galileo is a Christian. He was he was a student of I think it was Galileo or. Uh, one of the physicists, I think it was him. He was a Bible uh, prophecy scholar in the 1500s, 1600s or 1600s. And he searched his whole life. He knew there was some, and he couldn't find it. Cause, but he knew that there, there, was, there was something hidden in the letters. And he tried. And he spent more time doing that than discovering how an apple falls out, or whoever it was, anyway. Uh, the gravity and physics and all that. He uh, he was a fanatical scholar of the, <laughs> if you will. I mean, he was and he was searching, but he didn't have a computer. But when we got the computer, then that book came out some years ago now, probably twenty years or more now of the uh, uh, these uh, equal distant codes and and. And the rabbis say, the Talmud says, the great sages, the Zadiks of the past, uh, have all, many of them talk about, uh, they write, they've written about, uh, you know, all of creation is in, is in the very uh, fabric of the letters of the Torah. So, that's why it's an eternal document. You can't, it, nothing's passed away as far as the, the, there's so much, all of creation's hidden in there. 
and a lot of Jew, a lot of Christians just haven't been taught until recent years, really, uh, that there is anything significant to like. Well, that's all just. I don't need that anymore. No, it's not. In fact, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Paul and Peter. Peter writes all scripture. Is profit? No, Paul writes it's profitable. Peter said it's it's no private interpretation, and it's God breathed. So all of these things, uh, when we study, you start to dig in some of these areas. Um, you know, in the in the Torah and the Old Covenant, you start discovering everywhere you look pictures of Yeshua, pictures of Jesus. It's hidden in the the name itself. Yeshua. You know, I remember <laughs> several times I've, and I, I've been honored by that. I've been with Orthodox uh, Jews and even praying with them uh, uh, several times. Uh, I've been at the uh, Western Wall and I've been in several places where, you know, the, the real uh, observant ultra Orthodox, you know, they, and I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I didn't, I kept hearing. They were praying, and you know, and they 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 sort of mumble and they pray very fast, and they're praying through. They're just speaking the word, is what they're doing. A lot of psalms, a lot of, and, and the prayers are really the scriptures. They're just there's life in the word. Well, we know that, right? Of course, there's faith, there's life, there's well, that that's the same. I mean, it's just the first covenant. There, the new covenant has. Exceeding great and precious promises too, even better, great, greater ones. Well, so anyway, the uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm I remember one one time I was, gosh, where was I? I you know where I was? I was I went to play in a table tennis <laughs> uh, table table tennis uh, uh, tournament. Okay, and there was this. Uh, boy, teenage boy, who was orthodox. You know, he had a he had a yarmulke, black velvet type yarmulke. It was a certain, you know, Chabad. He was a, and he was playing, and he was amazing. And I think he was sponsor. I mean, he was he. I, he's probably now an adult. It was not too long ago. I think it was the last tournament I played in. I didn't, I didn't win, but I, I enjoyed it. You know, and now I'm, uh, anyway, haven't played in a while miss it though so anyway he, uh his father was with him and he said i'm going to the shul i'm going to the shul tonight and i talked to him and said would you like would, would you like to go with me and i was surprised i said well sure all right because i i had already been eliminated <laughs> so i was i was you know, a little little down maybe but Anyway, I went with this young man and his, or his, his father, and, they, and you know, he lived in New York, and so, it, and I'm going, I'm standing there, and, and there they have, and they stand and they pray their evening prayers, you know, and they're, they're it's called davening. So they're uh, this this man and his son and his, uh, the, I mean, and several other in the minion there, the congregation, whoever. It wasn't a big congregation, it was enough. So there they are. And they're, they're, and then I kept hearing this, Yeshua, Karavadasha, Yeshua, Yeshua. I keep hearing Yeshua. And I just, I could, I was, well, well, they're saying the name of Jesus. What, what? And, and you know, I, of course, I, I don't really read Hebrew, except when I was in that vision, I did. Because <laughs> God, God, I don't know, I was thinking that, I, it, God, anyway, so I haven't learned it yet. I will, I'm sure one, hey, we got forever, I'm going to get there. It is the holy language, it hasn't passed away, so, anyway, so there, there I, I keep hearing Yeshua, Yeshua, I must have heard it 20 times. And I think, what in the world? So I said, what is, what, you know, because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to pretend like I know what I, what, 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 I pray in tongues. <laughs> I didn't know what, because it sounded, <laughs> I'll let the Holy Spirit pray through me. He, you talk about praying perfectly. Well, I've, I've, my whole life is, is 
a fruit of that. I, I proved that I didn't know anything, but God in me knows a lot. Hallelujah. But so there I am, and I'm, I'm, uh, Dav- I'm you know, at least to some extent. I said, well, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up and learn, so I'm a, I'm a kind of a novice, but I am Jewish, so, so I just fellowship with him as a Jew. I didn't, and so he was evangelizing me, if you will. Some of the Chabad Nicks or whatever you want to, you know, some of them, they, they're very, um, they're very kind, and it's a mitzvah for this particular group, is especially, and I love them. I just love. I love God's people. <laughs> I just do. So I just, uh, Paul said to the Jew, I become a Jew that I may win the Jews to Messiah. So in order to do that, you have to, in fact, whoever you talk to, if you want to have any kind of impact on them, you have to love them and you have to understand them and accept them and understand where they are and give them whatever it is that would uh they could taste and see the lord is good oh there's something special and they will you know and some of these people say well you're very special you know some of these rabbis that i've gotten to you know i have a shabbat dinner with their family or something like that you know different places and and they just seem to be attracted to me and i am to them and so uh so they'll invite me uh, to uh, to mitzvah to have uh have uh uh, even strangers to come into your house on Friday night for dinner, you know, with your family. So that's a great honor, and it's considered so, a good deed. Uh, and it's and in, there's an encouragement to do that, especially if it's somebody who's Jewish who doesn't know doesn't know these things from a hole in the ground. wasn't raised American secular, you know, whatever any Western. You know. So they're. So they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them. And <laughs> so here we are. Why am I talking about that? Well, anyway, you can't you keep saying Yeshua, Yeshua. And I finally, I finally, I just, was, we, we got done. And, well, you want to go back? That We're going to, we go back. I want to watch my son. He's in the finals or something. Where was I? Gosh, I, I think that was in Las Vegas. That's right. Uh. I think it was a divorce. There was a the Nationals. That was the last time. Uh, Two thousand and five. Okay, and that was my last attempt. After that, I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> I like watching it, so I watched." Uh, but anyway, so we went back and saw the the evening match and the tournament. tournament. But before that, I was. I think we were on the way back. I had some dinner on the way back. Uh, this was not a Shabbat. This was a weeknight, I think. So uh, on the way back to the uh, convention center there, uh, and this was a Chabad group, uh, uh, you know, like a little congregation that was there that met. Well, uh, <clears throat> so I, 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 I'm so curious. I said, I said, Rabbi, tell me something. I I kept hearing and this word Yeshua, I kept hearing Yeshua, what is that? And he goes, oh, that means salvation. And I said, of course. Well, that's, that's our Messiah's name, <laughs> salvation. So Yeshua is just, or Yahshua, or Joshua, we would say, or yeah, it really is the, it's, that was, um, that was Jesus, just the Greek, of that, uh, so that that actually that name means something, and all Hebrew names mean they mean something. They describe in the Bible, particularly, they they describe uh, what that person is, you know, or who they are, or you know, they're named also after. Sometimes, a lot of times in the like Book of Genesis, they they all have meanings. They they all describe the person uh, or whatever. There's there's it's fascinating. You can do word studies even on the, the uh, you know, very Adam to Noah, you know, and you, you'll you see an encrypted message there uh, that, again, about 
become that Jesus is the Messiah. It's all through. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hundreds that we don't even, uh, not found yet, but it's all stacked up and in there. That's why it's so fascinating, and people spend their whole lives, many Jews too, spend their whole lives just, you know, eight hours a day studying the Torah, and some of them get really deep in God. I mean, they really do. You can't, you can't study God's word without, uh, at some level, the Lord loves us, and so he wants to come and be with us. <laughs> so he'll come upon it will come upon the, the, uh, these very devout Ezra-type Jews that just spend their whole life. Well, you know what? That's not hard for God to... He's able to reach those kind of people very easy. Like uh, one man said, for a Jew to receive Messiah is like going next door. Well, especially one of the biblical... I mean, the real God-fearing... I mean, all day long, they're blessing God and thanking him for every little thing. And a lot of things you hadn't thought of. They're already, they have got a prayer for it. They got a prayer to bless the, you know, it's like the, the fiddle on the roof uh, movie. He says, do you have a blessing for the czar? He says, yes, we have a blessing for everything. May the, may the Lord bless the czar and keep him very, very far away from us. <laughs> so, you know, there that that idea of sanctifying all, all the, the gifts God gives us all day long, is that's, isn't that just what Paul said to do? He said, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Messiah concerning you. So it develops a grateful, thankful heart, which uh, the Lord fellowships, that's, that's called praise or worship, or it's, it's also making things that are natural, holy, or the, it's sanctifying them. Um, the idea of setting apart and saying, Lord, thank you. Sometimes, I, like a uh, couple of days, we had an amazing day. We had a beautiful day today, too. It, uh, uh, but, you know, I go for a while, I start thanking God. Well, that's so wonderful that the, the, the breeze is just perfect. It's not, you know. Or if you go to Hawaii, you ever been to Hawaii? Oh, glory to God, I want to go back, especially when it's freezing cold somewhere else. Well, we would go in January sometimes, and that's the best time to go. Well, you're in on Maui, and hallelujah. And you say, wow, this is so wonderful. It's perfect. It's per and so you start thanking God for the palm trees and the beautiful ocean and the and the sushi that I would eat right out there on the, you know, when I went, I have... God sent me there for two weeks right in the beginning of 1999. I was exhausted. Well, we had, uh, Pastor Benny did a, uh, uh, Benny Hinn did a crusade in Honolulu. And then the Lord had me stay uh, and go to several of the islands. And there was a, a and I would, I, there was a lady who was a black, uh, not black, but she, she was a Pentecostal, a Hawaiian, I think, Hawaiian lady would, uh, Older, no, I think she was a missionary. She was American, but she was probably in her 70s or 80s. Somehow I hooked up with her and she had started all of these, I think it was called Door of Faith churches. <laughs> so I went and they were indigenous or they were the local. So I, she had me set up playing and preaching every night. I'd sleep and rest all day. Uh, and then I would preach at night, you know. Uh, and she she brought me around everywhere and, she was like amazing. She's with the Lord now, I'm sure. But I never, you know, so you, anyway, so there we are in Hawaii and I'm thanking God for all this because it's so beautiful and perfect. Well, you can even thank God when it's not. In fact, that's when God really gets happy. He'll start to dance. I mean, he gets happy. Uh, I noticed this too. When our praise and worship in the churches, sometimes God will give me, you know, wherever we are, you know, whatever I'm playing, or, or we're we're just in a worship time, and uh, when God gets really happy, sometimes He'll give me a glimpse of the throne room, or I'll just go, and I'll see it. You know, just sometimes just, and I tell you what, when the rabbis get up and dance before the throne, that's when God gets happy, and the Father Himself will get up and He'll dance too. He'll dance. 
I know that might sound irreverent to you, but I've only, I've only seen that one time actually, but wow. It, because there's something about, there's just something about when we start to praise and worship God, even if it's simple, but when God gets really happy or in, in the sense of, I mean, when, uh, when it's really something special, then it's amazing. Heaven joins in. And, uh, you know, God has a place for his firstborn there. He does. He does. He does. He does. Of course, we all come in through Messiah. I, of course. I, I know that. But, hallelujah. So, God's got it. All of God's words important. So, every detail has eternal significance and meaning. So, all right. So, this... Uh, golden head band is also worn, bearing an, ex, an the inscription Kodesh La Adonai, or Holy to the Lord. And you remember, on the mitre it says in the King James, and the mitre, holy. Mitre. Well, this is like a a name, uh, or uh, not a nameplate, but a, like a golden. It's a, but it has an inscription that's worn on the forehead there, I believe. So, <clears throat> all right. Notice that neither the regular Kohanim, or the, just the Levites, the priests, nor the Kohen Gadol, or the high priest, wore shoes or slippers. Uh, why? Well, God told Moses, take off your shoes when you're, this is holy. Now, there, there's something to that. We don't quite know. In other words, they served in the Mishkan and later in the temple barefoot. There's something uh of course there's hidden meanings about everything you could you could dig into that and find out i mean there's probably a hundred rabbis that spend spend you know have spent volumes talking about why were they barefoot <laughs> well there are reasons uh and and they'll be then they'll argue about it too they, 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 they'll say you know uh well no it, it really is because they know it's because of that and then, you know so there's there are such a thing as holy arguments, which uh, God doesn't mind that sort of thing. If we're, we've got the right heart attitude, that's all right. He'll tell us. We'll all find out very soon. <laughs> we'll know. God will answer. And we have, actually, the teacher himself comes. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, comes inside of us. And he'll teach you all things. And if you ask him, it's amazing the, what he'll show you. He showed me a lot of things because I'm not that smart. Uh, but hallelujah, you turn yourself over to uh, our teacher. He is our teacher, our helper, our paraclete, our one called alongside to help us in this life to do what we cannot do and to be a light to this world. So... Anyway, so they were barefoot. According to Jewish tradition, the bells were worn on the high priest's coat. I'm going to read a little now. In order to scare off any holy angels that were serving in the Kodesh section. That sounds a little superstitious to me. Of the Mishkan. Apparently, God did not want any of the angels to be critical of the high priest as he performed his duties. In other words, it was, it was some sort of it, but it was, I think it's more just so you could make sure <laughs> uh, he's still breathing and doing okay. Another tradition states that the bells were used. See, there's different traditions and they have different ideas. Uh, and they'll, they'll, there's whole, and they've, they've argued for hundreds of years over some of this. And another tradition states that the bells were used so that the Israelites would remember to pray for the priest as he served on their behalf. So, uh, he was a special guy and, and, uh, you know, <laughs> he was chosen by God and it was a holy thing. So we need to pray for those, especially the bare responsibility before the altar, the holy things of God. That's why it says now, the way do we apply that in the new, uh, is, uh, the Bible says, uh, Paul writes that those that minister uh, in the word and the holy things, those that God has called into the fivefold ministry or those that God has set apart, uh, he qualifies them. He qualifies them in the miraculous uh, and he qualifies with, with certain giftings that you can know. That's like the bells. It'll, it, it'll show you, well, this person, 
he couldn't do that without the supernatural help of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. So that kind of puts bells on you, you know. Uh, or, But those people, uh, Paul said, they're worthy of double honor. Esteem them highly, for they minister. And when those that labor in the word and 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 the the see because why well there's also a higher judgment he said uh, uh, Yaakov or James <laughs> Jacob the letter uh, Apostle James wrote in his letter he says um, that uh, don't be many teachers or don't be many rabbis that just means uh, someone. I mean, don't try to leave, no, you know, go do anything, sell shoes, play the violin, whatever. Just do whatever unless, uh, you know, uh, but he said, uh, you'll be judged stricter. Why? Because we bear responsibility. So there's a form of that. We do have a priesthood in the spirit under our high priest. But of course, it does not, we can go directly to the Father. That's the blessing of the book of Hebrews. We can go directly. We don't need an earthly priest. We don't need some friar here or some, that's the, it's not, uh, it's not a matter of, you know, having a bishop or a, a person to, you know, that, that, that's the great uh, blessing of the new covenant is, hallelujah, you can, boldly approach the throne of God and receive help at the throne of grace in the time of need. Hallelujah. And that's still in effect. And so, but God still uses, he, he puts, uh, he still has a priestly function and leadership in the body. Of course, we're, as that, we are called to be servants of all. But out of that, it's a, and of course, the Levites in the old covenant or God took a tithe. There was, and there's about that portion, really, if you look at the church, those who are serious and we would say on fire, maybe six to 10% should be at least, well, that's the inner court. That's the, you know, uh, those are those that, that they have chosen to stay close to, to the Lord and they want to. And so, hallelujah, there's a, but there's, there's, some that are called to minister of those holy things in the spirit realm to bring, uh, and uh, you know, bring uh, the 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 uh, 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 the table of the Lord. So we, in fact, I I want to end with that today. We're going to receive communion, and I know I haven't done that in a while. Y'all forgive me. I it's just been I've been pulled all kinds of different directions, and uh, I'm trying to keep and things are shifting for the better and a lot of good things are happening so all right so according to jewish tradition the bells were worn so um, for that reason the choshen or or breastplate of the high priest is described in this portion of torah as well this sacred vestment was worn over the ephod or the linen apron and contained two special gemstones called the Urim Vitumen, or the Urim and the Thummim, as, as, as the uh, English says, or they actually mean lights and perfections. It was a form of <laughs> a holy divination, if you will. And when I say holy, I mean God allowed that because this, the, the Spirit of God was not inside any, you know, everyone. He anointed uh, the high priest, and you could hear the ephod, which was a part of the ephod, this David, actually, because he was also, uh, he was, he, God had called him, not only as a king, but uh, he's a type of Messiah, he's a picture of the three realms, which is, uh, he was, he was the king of Israel, he was, uh, of course, he, no, his fourth, he's a psalmist, he's a sweet psalmist of Israel, but he was the king. He was a. He was also uh, the Davidic priesthood. There was, there was. So he was allowed. Actually, God allowed him to to function in both realms. That was a no no back. You know, I mean, uh, King Saul couldn't do that, and Samuel, of course, then there's prophets. There are prophets and priests, and well, those three 
in the new covenant are woven together in Messiah. So if uh, you have, it's like having an all access pass. <laughs> God did not give that to everyone. David, because uh, God had wanted to show him as, uh, it's like a prototype of Messiah. He's, he's the king of Israel. He's the prophet and he is, uh, he's the, he's, He's a psalmist, and he's uh, also a, uh, what was I saying, uh, a priest. He's the high priest. So all of these offices, if you will, and all of the ministry gifts are actually was shown in their perfection in the man Yeshua. He, he had apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, which are the hands of the body. He was able to touch. God is equipped these this through and also a priestly ministry through worship praise and worship is still passes through into the new covenant we we but we praise him in a higher realm than we did in the old but we still praise him that's why we can read the book of psalms and hallelujah they're just as i mean david you talk about a worshiper he was man he praised his way out of anything you get in trouble you start praising god God deliver him every time. I mean, he learned that. He said, oh, I will praise the Lord. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Psalm 34. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me. You know, so this this is another thing that passes into the new covenant, really uh, unchanged, except we behold him now uh, with full face, understanding. Uh, full uh, the Lord can fellowship with us. He doesn't have to be veiled. He doesn't. You don't have to wear pomegranates and bells in the natural. You don't have to be just one man can actually go into, you know. So all that, that's amazing. It's amazing because whosoever will, let him come. That's God took care of the sin nature problem. So we could, we could, so he could be our friend. He could separate us from our sin that it separated us from God. So we're, we are reconciled to God through that blood. Praise the Lord. All right, gosh. <clears throat> so these stones, there were two stones, are used to discern the will of God in some cases. When they didn't know, it would, I don't know if it lit up or whatever, it'd probably light up and shine yes or no. <laughs> and uh, even kings would go, but Saul, even King Saul, even when he was out of fellowship, and some believe he was out of relationship, God rejected him. I don't know. But uh, he was certainly not in right, I mean, not in right relationship or not fellowship with, with God. He, he had rebelled. Uh, but he still could go before. Uh, the, the, he, he would, that's what it says when it says, and they took the ephod and they inquired. David inquired of the Lord. Well, it was some sort of a device that would say yes or no, and it was it was very accurate. I mean, it never missed it, evidently, because uh, Saul actually he was trying to discover who it, you know who it was uh, that had eaten honey. Uh, remember, and it was Jonathan, his son, and. And it, he took this, I think he probably took this through the, the ephod and he found out. So you could, they used to inquire of the Lord, but we don't need that now. You don't have to go to the I Ching or something. And, or we don't have, you know, two lights. Yes, no. Some of us would love to have that. But honestly, you have God himself. He wants to talk to you all the time. You just, you have to, you just have to stay in a right relationship. And, and uh, you know, don't do your own thing all the time. Inquire of the Lord. It's all right. So <clears throat> some have claimed that the Shekinah, or the glory of God, would cause the Urim and the Thummim, or Tumim, to light up and shine upon the, uh, the Avne Chosen, which is the 12 gemstones in the chosen tribes, that remember it's on the ephod and it, it would actually light it would give revelation it's a picture of the indwelling holy spirit today the letters illuminated on the chosen would reveal an answer well that's interesting huh to a question posed by the high priest now remember this 
that uh, the occult, a Ouija board or something like that, and any kind of, uh, you know, ways of conjuring or seances or communication, all with the dead is demonic because God has not, he, he's not, he doesn't use familiar and demonic spirits to speak to us. And we could be, we had, and it's an abomination. God said, don't do it. It's a, you know, that is, uh, because why? Because, uh, familiar spirits are really demons that they, 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 they try to, uh, impersonate someone who's died or <clears throat> you'll be given information wow and it's a false say a false prof prophet that would say well i you know uh your aunt was named trudy and, and you lived on 3528 chestnut lane or something well uh that can either be the holy spirit who sometimes does signs and wonders through legitimate revelation gifts it's more rare than you think and uh, honestly i you always judge it anyway you, you you go by what god's word says but he does use that today and and there's a flow of that and that's wonderful but uh god forbids israel and he forbids uh, remember that's where he got saul got in real trouble he went to seek that woman uh in endor which endor that had a familiar spirit well that's uh, demons impersonating. However, what happened with that story <laughs> is I read it closely and I asked the Lord, and I've done some study about, remember Samuel? He says, I, you know, he said, conjure me up Samuel. Well, uh, actually, God, God intervened in that. Yeah, and Samuel actually did come up. <laughs> But it, it it knocked him flat on the floor and he was judged by God. He said, tomorrow you'll be with me. Well, this was actually, was not a familiar spirit. He tried to get a familiar, God, God, you know, because God can do anything. I'm not saying he does it. He was in, I mean, he was, God was pissed off. I mean, that's bad. What he did was so bad uh, because, uh, anyway, there's reasons for that, but there, there was a legitimate, uh, legitimate way that God could communicate through. And again, it, he went through the high priest here. And all right. So since each stone was inscribed with a name of a tribe of Israel, the letters illuminated uh, on the Hoshan would reveal an answer to the question posed by the high priest. Okay, so that's what that was. Part of the priestly clothing. All right, now this ephod was arranged with four rows of three stones. Each stone was inscribed with six letters representing a name of the tribe of Israel for a total of 72 letters. It was an actual, it was a, a, a total, I mean, God could, I guess, he'd light up the whole, I didn't know that. He, he'd light up the uh, whole, uh, uh, I mean, he talked to him. Well, that sounds like uh, something, you know, Strange. So row one was Reuben, which is Ruby, Simeon, which is Topaz, and Levi, which is Garfunkel. Or Gar Garfinkel. Wow. I wonder who Garfunkel was. I think he's Jewish. I think those are two Jewish boys. That's what I think. Um, the sound is like Garfinkel is the word for Levi. <laughs> Interesting, huh? Finkel. I have a, I have a cardiologist named uh, Fingal, I think, or Finkel or something. I, I, I anyway, it's a form of, uh, there was a really fine modern bow maker named Finkel, uh, as well as one of the greatest cellists, uh, chamber music cellist, uh, uh, is, was an Emer Emerson Quartet, his last name was Finkel as well. So anyway, row two, <laughs> row two is a Judah, Carbuncle, Issachar, Sapphire, and Zebulun, which is pearl. Row three, Dan, Jacinth, Naphtali, Agate, and Gad, Crystal. Row four, Asher, Emerald, Joseph, Onyx, and Benjamin, Yashne, an unknown stone. Well, notice 
Where, what, what does this remind you? Doesn't it remind you of the book of Revelation? See, God fulfilled the, uh, even in the eternal city, which is New Jerusalem, uh, these, these gemstones, uh, the tribes are present. So there's some, there's eternal significance. So it's kind of like birth stones where are a, a poor, a, a poor copy of that counterfeit, if you will. It's not, it, this is, this is, these are the first, uh, these are the stones God chose and they're precious. So it shows that we, and we're to bear on our hearts. See, that's the real example of what the fivefold ministry of the leaders in the body of Messiah too. And of course, rabbis in the Jewish world as well. And we, uh, we are to be the servants of all and bear the infirmities of the weak, like Yeshua. And so the high priest would bear on his, uh, uh, wear on his body when he came before the Lord, he would actually, those, uh, the stones, and, and, and he, was, he was an intercessor. See, he was interceding. He, and that's what really uh, we're to do, uh, all of us are to, let, to intercede for those. So the greatest, Paul, uh, Yeshua said, is the servant of all and is the lowest, and, and yet that's how God operates the kingdom. So, hallelujah. That's why Paul would always say, yes, I'm an apostle called by God, and this is my gospel. God revealed him something that when, nobody else quite has the place of, of the apostle Paul. Uh, and yet he'd say, well, but I'm your servant or your bond slave. So both of these things, if you want the highest you want to really please God, you enter into this priestly ministry, which is servant of all, serving every, just like Jesus did. He did the same thing. So we're to serve and we're to carry all of God's people on our hearts and be ready to, ready to, uh, Lord, what, how can I help the, your, your precious ones, you see? That's, that's really the foundation of the bride, the church, uh, and all spiritual leadership, uh, according to God and the Bible, is to operate that way. Moses was. Moses, you know, bore, he said, I have to carry these Jews <laughs> in the wilderness, and they made a golden calf, and, you know, and, and, but God, he interceded, and the Lord repented. He changed his mind. Okay, I won't wipe them out. But nevertheless, they, he says, I will, two things about Israel, God says right there to Moses when he's interceding. He says, first of all, he said, know this, I will visit their sins upon them. And in other words, they received, in fact, the book of Isaiah, the, the end of Isaiah, my favorite part of the, the, the prophets of all, Isaiah 40 through 66 starts in those first chapter or two, it says, uh, he says, uh, yeah, right there in the beginning about Jerusalem, speak unto her that your iniquities pardon, your, your, your sins are, he says, for your shame, you have borne double. In other words, Israel has borne through the generations. Uh, their sins were, that, I mean, see, you can thank God you're not under the law because uh, the, <laughs> we're not under the law as far as redemption is concerned. God is a God of law and order. He's a God of justice. He's a God of right and wrong. But, <clears throat> hallelujah, <laughs> he's a God of mercy and mercy triumphs over judgment. And God made a way through Messiah. Amen. I just keep cycling that over. I, I think someone who's Jewish is watching me and that, so the Holy Spirit is is having me just turn it and turn it and turn it until he just cycles around the mulberry bush again and again. That's the way prophetic ministry operates. All right, so according to the Gemara, the Shamir was a miraculous worm <laughs> as small as a grain of barley that was used to engrave the names of the tribes on the stones. You know, some of that, I, it, it's like God 
inscribe their names supernaturally through this uh, worm. That's some, and I, that's, I don't know where that is. It's not in the Bible that I know of. <clears throat> Believers in the Mashiach, Yeshua, or Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, are likewise appointed to be a kingdom of priests. I just said that. First Peter 2, 9, and have direct access to the Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit to discern the will of God. Hallelujah. We don't need stones to light up anymore. We do this through faith, asking the Lord for wisdom and trusting in his light and perfection to guide us into all the truth. Again, the type in shadow and then the fullness, the substance is in the new. Amen. And that's what God's always wanted, a living relationship. He walks with us, talks with us. Amen. Um, now, uh, the altar of incense. The altar of incense, I'm going to just read now, was the second altar of the Mishkan. The first was the large uh, Mizbiach Haola, or altar for animal sacrifices. Remember the brazen altar, we call it, in the outer court. It was constructed of wood overlaid with pure beaten gold and placed in the Kodesh, or holy section, of the structure next to the menorah and the shulchan, perhaps right next to the parochet, or the curtain, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, right? Twice a day, in, mo in the morning and again in the afternoon, a priest would burn incense on this altar as an intercessory reminder to the Lord on behalf of Israel. A uh, teaching or midrash states that even though there were there was only a thin layer of gold covering the altar of incense, the wood was never scorched by the fire. Hallelujah. Why Aaron's descendants and not Moses' descendants? In connection with the uh, Avoda, excuse me, service at the Mishkan. The question may arise as to why Aaron's descendants were chosen to serve uh, as priests and not Moses's. In other words, why wasn't Moses chosen to be the high priest, Kohen Gadol, for Israel? Rashi, he was a very, he was a Zadik, he was a, a rabbi in, all the way back in the Middle Ages, I think, great, uh, great sage. Uh, Rashi states that the Lord at first wanted Moses, at first wanted Moses to be the high priest, but because he refused to lead Israel, and again, this is not, it's not actually in the word, but it's in the oral tradition. So some of them are, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. <laughs> but this is interesting. Uh, but because he refused to lead, lead Israel at the incident of the burning bush, God chose his brother and his descendants to be the Kohanim, whereas Moses and his descendants would be Levites or assistants to him instead. Prophetically, even though Moshe or Moses himself was a type or picture of, the, of Messiah Yeshua, he was unable to enter into the land of ultimate promise and the entire priesthood system based on the Mishkan and later the temple was that's the, uh, the the tabernacle, and then the temple was destined to be superseded by the greater priesthood, as we talked about, after the order of Melchizedek, or son of righteousness, which is Jesus, the first <laughs> born from the dead, the, the perfect high priest ever living. Uh, see, God became a man forever, even though he is God, and he is one, but he he loved the world so much he became through Abraham's seed the promise was made he became a man and then was resurrected as both God and man he was both God and man it, 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 that's a mystery and it's amazing and it's called the incarnation in the Christian world and it's very real and in fact if you want to know that's exactly he was the firstborn of many brethren that's the way we are. We are to have God living and walking, and he made us sons and daughters, and that's why you must <laughs> be born again, Jew or Gentile. You must receive a spiritual rebirth. Amen. You must be born from above, recreated. 
Okay, so Jesus is the great high priest and king from the royal tribe of Judah. His priesthood is after the order of, of Melchizedek, based on the unchanging promise of God himself, Psalm 110, verse 4, and excels the priesthood of Levi as much as the substance excels its shadow. Like I was, now that's really a primary, maybe the primary revelation of the, uh, or certainly one of the most important of the letter to the Hebrews. And that's what, he's better. He's better than the, uh, God shows how he is actually deity manifest in the flesh. He is God. Okay, nonetheless, the foreshadowing of the Mishkan was not given to Israel in vain, the, the tabernacle. Like the menorah and the ketoret, our lives should shine the light of truth to others and evoke the savor of heaven wherever we go. <laughs> I'm, rubbing, I'm rubbing some, or, some Orthodox Jews watching me now. I know it because I'm going into, and it's just rubbing your cat the wrong way. Well, bless your heart. Maybe, you're, maybe you need to learn. Maybe you don't know everything. <laughs> I, well, you're a heretic. I don't know what you call that. You're a, you're not a real Jew. Well, I beg to differ. I didn't ask for this job. I was born this way. What happened to me was supernatural. That's different. But I love you, and I will continue. <laughs> Your choice is whether to turn me off or not. <laughs> and so far you haven't been able to. Glory to God. I love you anyway. And I'm going to keep going. Notice that the first point, verse of this, of the parasha, the portion, includes the phrase, you shall take for yourselves olive oil. The implication of the commandment is not so much to give to the Lord as much as it is to take from one's life that which belongs to the Lord already, that is holy, the first is an offering. It, that's one of the ways we worship God is with the best of our substance. Or and this, in the modern world, most often that medium ex, of exchange in our generation is uh, actual, you know, through money or through revenue. Uh, but, you know, in some countries it's bringing your chicken. You know, you have an extra chicken and that's something great with God, or you bring something. The, the Torah says, don't appear before God empty-handed, always. And, and you know what? I've learned something. The more, like Oral Roberts used to say, when your gift, when, when, your, uh, when your oil, okay, so we call it olive oil, or your, when it moves you and it's precious to you and you feel it, that's when God responds exponentially, sovereignly. That's where the multiplication comes. So it's the it's not just how much or where was it it's it's the uh it's how precious it is. And and also it's not it's not in the amount, it's in the heart. You have to like when you whenever you give, when you tithe, I tithe and I give offerings, but it's my I the first thing I do is I worship the Lord. I inquire, Lord, what can I do? I don't want to appear before you empty-handed, you know. And then he'll put something on your heart. And when you feel, and sometimes it could be, wow, that's more than I would have thought of or whatever. But when you feel that, and then you you give as a sacrifice of praise. That's just like, see, God told Israel, he said, give on that brazen altar. You give the, not the, not the, uh, the lamb with a blemish, you give your best, the, the, the one that has the most value, give to God first. And then, since he's the source, this is how God, that's one of the ways, primary ways, actually, we worship God. And that's why, you know, people get, Christian, many Christians say, well, tithing is Old Testament. Well, it really technically isn't because it existed before the Torah, before the law of Moses, not before the Torah, before the law of Moses, uh, and uh, it, 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 exists, it exists in heaven. Yeshua, our, our uh, uh, high priest, 
Gadol, uh, Kohen Gadol, our forever high priest in heaven, says receives what? Our tithes, just like he did Abraham or Melchizedek or the, who Abraham came and gave 10% to and God blessed him and empowered him. So that is, that is an eternal pattern, okay? That's, and, and it was repeated with Isaac and then again with Jacob, just so you knew for sure. <laughs> this wasn't just, uh, you know, this was something covenant because God says on the, forever the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember when God says forever, he doesn't mean for a little while and then he changes. No, God doesn't change. He's the same God as he, yesterday, today, and forever, Yeshua is uh, Lord, amen. So anyway, uh, so here we go. The substance excels its shadow. Nonetheless, the foreshadowing of the tabernacle was not given to Israel in vain, and our lives should shine the light of truth to others and evoke the savor of heaven. I already read that, wherever we go. All right. Um, yes, so the implication of the, the, the offering of the olive oil here uh, the holy oil is uh, give to God what he is already his. And so we give to God, he gives us everything, and then we're able to return to him. And then the rest of it, the high priest blesses it. Hallelujah. You want to get out from under the curse and never, you want to get to the place where, uh, <clears throat> do you always feel like there's more, uh, month at the end of the money, somebody said. In other words, you don't, you have a bag with holes in it, Haggai wrote, or you, 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 you feel like you're always trying to catch up, you know. Well, first place you look, am I, am I tithing in worship and obedience with the right heart, and am I consistent, and am I obeying God in it? First place you look, because I have never, I tell you what, uh, two things in my experience, two things. I've never met a tither who doesn't make it. <laughs> They'll make it. God will make sure you make it. First of all, I haven't, though, a real, and if, you know, again, it has to be, you have to be in the right relationship, fellowship with God, your heart. But anybody, every time when you circumcise your finances, God breaks the curse. And I've never, I'll tell you this, I've never met someone who does not tithe that uh, isn't struggling. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean, does God require it? Technically, no. I guess you could say, do you really want, you want to be new covenant? All right. It, 100%, everything <laughs> belongs to God. Well, of course, it does anyway. He gives it to you. But he still asked for the first fruit. So that's that principle goes into the new covenant as well. And I've seen these, both of these. And when I say always and never, I mean it. I've I don't think I've ever met someone in the church that uh does not tithe, of course they won't admit it most of the time, that is not struggling. But why? Because it opens you up and the devil steal and devour and you're you 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 put a you put your you, it's like a pocket with holes in it. Uh, it just falls out like rocks out of, well, God will fill up. I tell you what, I tell you what, that's the only place in the Bible that God says, the only subject, only thing he says, prove me, <laughs> I'll show you. Well, that's in Malachi. So this is very important, especially as we get into these last days. You can't play around with this. You don't play around with the holy tithe any more than they would going uh, before the Lord without, uh, you know, the right protocol in the Mishkan or the temple. You, you can't do that. Don't do it. Because why? Because God's mean and he wants to. No, it's so you, you can lock the devil out. He can't, the thief can't steal it. The curse can't devour it. See, you've redeemed from the curse, but that means you have to walk under the covenant of God. 
it's not a matter of, now you say, well, that's not required. Well, no, I guess not. You can struggle if you want to. <laughs> Why? And I can tell you this. The first thing from now on, first thing you do, and I'm not saying you have to give to me. No, no, I'm not talking about that. God tell you about that. He, he's the Lord of the, Jesus is the Lord of the tithe, okay? So who do you take it to? Him. So I say, well, should I tithe here or should I tithe there? Why don't you ask the Lord of the tithe? <laughs> ask him. Or even better, go before him and worship him and bring it to him. Lord, this is yours. What do you want me to do with it? See? That's when, that's when tithing activates the grace of God. And uh, the curse and the devourer is, is rebuked. And you start, you, the, the, the holes are sealed in your financial struggle. Uh, your bag will say, well, I tithe and I still will. That doesn't mean you won't go through some challenging times. But I guarantee you watch a man or woman like that. And they'll come out every time. Why? Because God takes personal responsibility. He never fails. He is our provider. Well, somebody must have needed to hear that. So don't play around with that unless you want to keep struggling. You want to keep struggling? Uh, I don't. I said, I'm going to do it God's way. And that's his way. And he hadn't changed. He's still the same. I think God required of Adam the tithe. What was the tithe for Adam? Don't eat of that tree. <laughs> One thing that God said, this is not yours. And then there was a tree of life. And it says he was taught to bring offerings to the Lord. Now, think of Cain and Abel. What did they do? They brought what? An offering or a tithe of their fruit of their life. One brought an animal. One brought, uh, uh, I mean, Cain. But his heart wasn't right, as well as it wasn't blood. <laughs> so for redemption, uh, that's, you know, God killed an animal and uh, clothed Adam and Eve. And every time I say Adam and Eve, I always say, uh, God made Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. Remember that. All right, so, I don't like that. I really don't care. <laughs> I love you, but I don't care. <laughs> I could care less. What, you know, well, that's, we have our rights. Well, what? Moral failure is not civil rights. A person makes choices morally. A person cannot make choices racially difference. Big difference. I'm not going on with that. Okay. Okay. Notice the first verse of the portion includes the phrase, you shall take for yourselves. I told you that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> this act of returning to God is inviolable. Establishing the correct order of life is very well, well written. Yields blessing now and in the world to come, or as uh, the Jews would say, the Olam Haba. That's when, hallelujah, uh, everything will be. The scales of justice will be, God will owe no man anything. You'll be rewarded for everything. And also, that's in the realm of, of evil as well. Hallelujah. So, all right. Now, let's look at this here. Um, as well, I'm gonna, well, you know what I think I'll do? Gosh, it's already, I started at five. It's already seven o'clock. Where did, where did all my time go? <laughs> you get to preaching, I know. All right. And I haven't forgotten the violin. I'm going to do that. Um, I'm getting there. The main thing, I'll tell you what y'all should pray and agree with me, with, for me, is uh, I have to take this medicine right now, but the energy level has been about half of what I used to have. And that's not easy. 
because, and you know, it's not easy to, to do as much. So I believe God's got a breakthrough for me because I'm not going to live with a sky high blood pressure and I'm not going to, uh, not take, I mean, I, 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 for now, that's what God's given me. Hallelujah. So I'm going to continue until he tells me something else. Very good. All right. I tell you what, y'all, if you need to go, please, I'll release you and bless you, whatever, but you know, otherwise I want to, I so much want to honor the Lord in this Feast of Purim and, 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 and talk about that. So it took me longer than I expected. It takes me a while. So let's look at <clears throat> what is Purim. What is it? It starts now, tonight and tomorrow. Uh, we celebrate this in the Jewish world, as God has asked us to. And, and I believe there's a blessing <clears throat> when the body of Messiah joins us. Because it was a, a time of great victory and a time of great oppression. <clears throat> Israel was not in their land. They were <clears throat> in a, a, a foreign land in Persia. And uh, yet God delivered us, and we remember that. And it's uh, <clears throat> throughout our generations. So Purim means the Feast of Lots, or uh, as you give a lot, or you give, you know, somebody, <clears throat> if somebody, uh, you know, you choose who's, who's the man that's going to go in, you know, to, the, to get the... <laughs> potatoes or something well there or it's dangerous in the enemy lines well if you get the short short uh toothpick or something that well that's this was actually a story from the book of esther about the taking of a lot and how god how god even in seeming chance still always delivers his people he's covenant he's faithful even if it looks like people are as dumb as a dodo bird. I mean, the king was not that swift, okay? Uh, Ahasuerus, or whatever, however you say his name, or uh, Xerxes, or whoever he was, I think that's the, Well, he wasn't the swiftest, you know. <laughs> swift, he wasn't the, what do you say, you know, the, the, it wasn't the swiftest Gentile king in the world. <clears throat> but he had Mordecai. And the real hero of the book of Esther, <clears throat> which we read every year in this night and tomorrow, uh, <clears throat> short book, <clears throat> last chronologically of the Old Covenant in sense of history. It was the... Uh, now, there are other books that are apocryphal, but as far as what we acknowledge, at least in the Christian Protestant world as <clears throat> scripture or canon it, this is the last and I think in the, so uh, Israel uh, is delivered in the time of great attack well <clears throat> that's again covenant God's made covenant you're not going to wipe us out you understand Mr. Devil you can't wipe us out Haman you can't kill us hallelujah Every generation's had a Haman, the, the Jews say, but <clears throat> someone's tried to wipe us out, you know, every, every generation. And yet, <clears throat> not one has failed. I mean, sorry, not one has succeeded. They've all failed. We're still here. <clears throat> well, that's a miracle. Uh, why? God has an eternal purpose and a future for the Jewish people. And in fact, even the tribes of Israel even though we don't know the, those 10 tribes or where, who they are or where they are, don't try to figure it out because you don't know either. Well, I'm a part of this. Well, maybe spiritually you're grafted into that. I don't know. <clears throat> but you don't know, and I don't know yet either. But God knows, and he's going to take care of all of that, and then we'll go, oh, now I know. God didn't reveal that yet, so don't try to be any more. I always say this, <clears throat> you can't get any higher than son or daughter of God. And that's totally based on the blood and the new birth and gift of grace. You can't get any higher than son or daughter of God. 
And so don't try to, well, I'm, I'm extra special. I, and that's where we get in trouble as, as believers. That's what we do. Because when we start trying to impress God that we're super duper extra special, and then, I mean, that can take many forms. It can take Christian religion. You start getting on a treadmill like a jerk, then you start earning. You start trying to do it. You start trying to impress God. Well, I'm really something. Well, your, your extra brownie points, that's not how you get anywhere with God. If you, want, if you want to receive from God, you have to come into faith. Faith overcomes the world. Faith receives from heaven. Faith, everything you receive from God is not based on merit. That doesn't mean that it does when you obey God and you keep the commandments, if you will, out of love through the new nature, God empowers you to say no to sin and, and the devil and rebellion. And it keeps you, you know what it does is it keeps the devil off of you and the curse. You see, we're redeemed from the curse of the law through the blood of Yeshua so that we have been become both Jew and Gentile in Messiah. We are now uh, uh, he's our redeemer and we are now redeemed from the curses of uh, poverty, sickness, and spiritual death, which is Deuteronomy 28, all the curses. Uh, the first 15 verses are the blessings of the law and the Abraham. When you keep this, you'll be God promised Israel. You'll be a peculiar treasure. You'll be, you'll, it's like you can't, you can't keep uh you can't keep a God-fearing, obedient <laughs> uh, Jew down. It, he'll end up floating to the top. I don't care if he comes in like Ben-Hur, you know, the story of Ben-Hur. You know, he's a slave. He ends up being the... <laughs> well, why? Well, that's God's work. That's the blessing of Abraham, and that, that, that's there. But both the blessing and the curse of the law has come upon the Jewish people. Why? Because we sinned. We committed idolatry. We broke covenant. And God, very clearly, it says he divorces Israel in the book of Jeremiah. <laughs> he gives them a writing of divorcement. It's just like a, why? Because they departed from, we, I should say, departed from God. Well, of course, all of us have sinned, according to Romans, fallen short of the glory of God. But see, so the book of Esther is a book of intervention by God supernaturally. And he doesn't need many. He needs a few people. And he'll do it some way he decides. And he'll always honor those. What, what was the conduit? Mordecai is really the hero of Esther. Now, Esther was wonderful. She was beautiful. She was like our first lady, you know, Melania, you know, just beautiful, stunning. And she was, she loved God. She was gifted. But Mordecai was the power. He was the one that God, he was like Daniel. You know, he was behind the scenes, but, and the king was, okay, Haman, you want to destroy you? Sure, take my signet, you know. And so he put a, he put the wrong guy in authority. That's like, anyway. <clears throat> so evil triumphs when there's foolishness and when there is, uh, the curse can come in where we want to go our own way and not God's way. So, but so the Deuteronomy chapter 28 is the blessing and the cursing of the law. But notice <clears throat> that entire chapter, 60 something verses, the vast majority of that is one curse after the other. And, in, of course, in the English, we don't have a permissive verb sense like the Hebrew. So, when it says, you know, <clears throat> it says in the English Bible, it says, and God will send upon you, he will do it. And he's going to, and God will bring this on, and God's doing it. Well, it actually, there's no permissive, he will permit God will permit you to live under the curse, <laughs> but you don't have to. And uh, believe me, you don't want to. And according to Galatians chapter 3, Yeshua bore the curse for us. Why? You had the crown of thorns. That was a curse of poverty. He bore the curse 
that came upon Adam and his uh, race through uh, when the, uh, you know, you, and you show the labor, the sweat of your brow. Uh, you'll live by that. Why? That's, that is what happened after the fall when Satan took spiritual dominion or the serpent, Hasatan, we, like in the first chapter of Job, talks about who brought all that calamity. Did God? No. God didn't bring the calamity on Job. Read it carefully. Who did? It says the sons of God, whoever they are in that context. That's the oldest book, by the way. Oldest book, book of Job. First, oldest book, uh, chronologically. The newest, or the most recent, is Esther. So that's sort of the beginning and the end, if you go. Well, Job, it says... It's a, one of the few places in the Old Covenant where Hasatan or Satan is revealed. He comes before God and he was the one, he was the one that brought all that calamity. I'm telling you this. Uh, well, wasn't Job, didn't, Job never sinned. He said he was righteous. God said he was a righteous and upright man. Now that doesn't mean he was perfect. It meant that he he feared God, he kept the covenant and his conscience. In other words, he was a, a as for that time period, he, uh, in, in that, when, how God dealt with man in that time, he was a, uh, I think, a, a very close, I think he was alive when Abraham was, some, somewhere around that same, he was a, probably a relative. But he was a great man and God had made him that way. So Satan, who's a liar, said, well, you curse him and he'll... Well, the whole reason for all that attack, Satan did. Why? Well, what did his wife say? Curse God and die. Boy, that's encouragement. I, my first wife basically said that to me. <laughs> Forget, I, don't, I didn't mean to say that. But I'm still here. And I don't, you know, bless her heart. I hope she's still saved. I don't even know. Bless her heart. Uh, and I, God's restored. I've had a Job experience in my life. I lost everything and got back just like Job, twice as much even. I mean, and uh, God's able to do that. Why? Because Satan cannot sustain an attack and forever. And uh, so God allowed, yes, because he has to allow. Well, what happened? What opened the hedge? What opened the door? He said, Every day he sacrificed. Every day, he, oh, my sons may have, he got into a place of fear. He began to be afraid. Now, does that mean that there isn't unjust suffering? Of course. I, why did, why God, why? I, there's a mystery there. And God redeems us out of suffering. I'm not saying that, but he doesn't, he's not the one up. God isn't schizophrenic, you know? God isn't a child abuser. Did you know that? God is good. And in him is no evil. He's, he's a good God. I mean, Oral Roberts, get on his, first thing he'd say, coming on the TV in the 50s, you know. <laughs> Not that I saw, I just saw some reruns of that. But, and uh, when he'd get up, he'd say, God is a good God. And the devil's a bad devil. Well, you get your theology straight. Um, you get, and finally understand, God's not the one uh, killing <clears throat> Uh, you know, causing uh, children to die of overdoses. And he's not a child abuser. God doesn't teach us. It's like taking a, a, a toddler and saying, don't touch that stove, it's hot. Daddy told you not to stud. And you turn your back, what happens? They touch the stove and their hand, the skin of their hand burns on. Did you do that, Dad? Did you do that? No. The child was uh, did not do what the father asked him to do. The father, he wants to protect you. You live in a dangerous world down here because uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, not everybody is good. <laughs> and not, uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of, of terrible things, but, but God, God is greater. And you stay in the covenant and you stay in a place of safety. 
And the new covenant is so wonderful, it's not even based on your behavior. It's based on the finished work of Messiah. <laughs> he got the job done. He said, it's finished. We don't have to do this every year anymore. Besides, we can anymore as the Jews. We had to, we had to do something because we couldn't go. We still celebrate the, the, the Day of Atonement in that sense. We honor, you know, and we remember the temple. Well, when the temple's rebuilt, well, they'll, 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 yeah, of course. And there will be a Messianic temple as well. It's found in the book of Ezekiel, the end of Ezekiel. So uh, that's where actual animal sacrifices will be done by the Levites, literal Jewish descent, Levites, Israelites, in the Messianic temple. And does that redeem us? Absolutely not, any more than the scapegoat does. There will be object lessons, and Yeshua, our Messiah, will teach us I am this, I am that, I did this, I, and there's going to be a temple on earth like there is in heaven. That's God, you know, but anyway. So let's look at this. <clears throat> the story of the book of Esther. The story goes back <laughs> to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, 630 to 562 BC, who, on account of the chronic apostasy of the Jews became uh, the rod of God's wrath or the he became that uh, he became now that I don't have time to explain that but it does say that the rod of God's wrath by conquering God has holy anger against uh, and when we get outside that covenant the consequences of sin what are the wages of sin death death is not God's will. It's separation from God. But that is the consequences. So that's, and, and in the Old Covenant, God took responsibility because uh, we, were, we were not spiritually alive. We had no authority over Satan. So how, why should he? If you, but we now have authority in Yeshua's name to drive out Satan, just like Jesus said. You can bind the works of darkness and you can enforce the covenant <laughs> of God. And that's our, that's the place that we are now. So anyway, uh, he conquered the land of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, besieging Jerusalem, <coughs> burning the temple of Solomon, and eventually carrying the Jews off into captivity. This became known as the Babylonian exile. And among the Jews who were deported from Judah to Babylon was a young man named Daniel. Remember? The prophet, who later served in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar allowed the exiled Jews to settle <clears throat> along the banks of the Euphrates River. Remember, the first captive, God went captive 70 years, and then we went back, okay? But then we finally, the big one happened. But not, this was the first one. First exile, seven years. Nebuchadnezzar allowed the exiled Jews to settle along the banks of the Euphrates River and to establish their own centers of learning and worship. In fact, some of the greatest Jewish learning ever produced, including the Babylonian Talmud, that's when it really came forth, uh, would come from those who were exiled in ancient Babylon. So these, there was basically revival. <laughs> you know, when we get in trouble, when God's people get in trouble, we cry out to God. When we're fat and sassy and got everything we need, what happened to Israel? Every time they turned to idols. Every time. That's just the fallen nature. That's the evil inclination is what uh, in, the, in the Jewish world is called. Yeah. In the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, in time, he died and his son ruled. Later, his grandson, Belshazzar, assumed the throne. Remember that? He lasted one day, I think. <laughs> this is that King Belshazzar mentioned in Daniel 5, who threw a feast and drank from the holy vessels of the temple, uh, <clears throat> looted by his grandfather from Solomon's temple. While he was reveling and praising, that's in the book of Daniel, gods of gold and silver, Boy, we have a lot of gods of gold and silver today, don't we? <clears throat> he and his guests, I mean the world does, 
and much many believers do too. He and his guests saw a mysterious handwriting, a message on the wall. In his consternation upon seeing the disembodied hand write these words, Belshazzar vainly sought for an interpretation from his soothsayers. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, this is my uh, cranberry water here. Soothsayers. <coughs> Finally, the Hebrew prophet Daniel was dispatched who interpreted the writing to mean both the end of King Belshazzar's reign and of the Jewish people's exile into Babylon. That's the backdrop of this book. Daniel's words proved true, of course. <coughs> that very night, the Medes, led by Darius I and the Persians, uh, led by Cyrus. Remember, they were the ones in the the image of, of, of the second Gentile empire after the head of gold, which was Nebuchadnezzar. So this was, this was the, 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 the next phase of the times of the Gentiles, okay? <coughs> Medes and Persians, Medes and Persians, <coughs> led by Cyrus, jointly attacked Babylonia and King Belshazzar was killed. Initially, Darius was made emperor, but a year later, Cyrus, we've heard that name a lot, haven't we? Even in even our modern political times. <coughs> Cyrus became the undisputed emperor of the Medes and Persians of the vast Medo-Persian Empire. King Cyrus was kindly disposed to the Jews. Isn't that wonderful? and even decreed that they should return to Judah and to rebuild the temple of the Lord. In this regard, Cyrus was a Gentile Messiah, or he, he was a deliverer of our people. A Messiah of the Jewish people who, like Moses, was raised up by God himself to enable the Jews. Again, covenant promise to be fulfilled. It was an amazing thing. Uh, it was a miracle. Uh, if God can make a uh, uh, self-centered uh, man who's given himself totally to money and profit for his whole life and business, doesn't care about anything, make, make somebody like that into a godly president like we have had, and I believe he's not done yet, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Trump, President Trump, then that's what, that's what God did to Cyrus. He just turned him around and went, and President Trump came really to, to the fullness of faith while he was in office. He, he did not come in in the same way that he left. Anyway, so I'm not, I don't know why. I didn't. So he, many believe he, and even in many Jews and, and, and rabbis and Israel looked at him as a kind of Cyrus because of how, what he did for Israel and how he defended the Judeo-Christian, I mean, the Bible. Basically, everything he did was biblical as far as uh, Israel and many, many things that, all right, we, we God help us. Without Cyrus, I don't think, I mean, God would have found some way to do it, just like he did with Esther. But uh, God did a miracle to make this Gentile dodo head king and made him just love Israel and go back, rebuild your temple. I make a decree and we'll, we'll pay for it too. I mean, it was amazing. And, and so, all right. <coughs> <coughs> Backdrop, okay. Uh, so, 200 years before Isaiah had named Cyrus in his prophecy as the one who would come to rescue God's people, he did that 200 years before, and there was Cyrus, rose up and did it 200 years later. However, even though the leaders of Israel did in fact return to Jerusalem 
<coughs> Finally, thus ending the 70 years of exile is prophesied to Jeremiah. Most of the Jews <laughs> chose to remain in Persia. In fact, if you really want to look at it, it was about a tithe of the about 10% or less, uh, which is normal. That's about how many of God's people obey him, <laughs> really, and go all the way, you know. According to the parable of the sower, Mark chapter 4, it's about 6%. That's the good soil, hundredfold. Only 6% of those who hear the word. 6 to 8%, really. <laughs> if you mathematically break it down in the four uh, heart condition thing. So, <clears throat> uh, all right. So, most of the Jews chose to remain in Persia. After Cyrus's death, about 369 BC, a Hazarius or Akashverosh, <laughs> the Hebrew transliteration, became <clears throat> ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire. I, it may be one of the Xerxes I, I read in history. I can't quite remember right now. But <clears throat> like Belshazzar before him, Ahasuerus made the mistake of partying with the holy vessels <laughs> from Solomon's temple, which apparently had not been restored to the Jews by King Cyrus. They didn't bring them back. <clears throat> However, according to the Jewish sages, instead of the Persians being judged for this act, <clears throat> the Jews themselves were to be judged through the machinations of a particularly nasty prime minister of Ahasuerus named Haman or Haman, Haman. And thus begins the story of the book of Esther. Watch out for wicked administrators. <laughs> you better, you know, especially when you have a dumb king or someone that is, you know, not dumb, but, um, you know, like a absentee father in a way. Sometimes some just, 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 just not paying attention. So I call King Cyrus, kind. I mean, sorry, Ahasuerus was kind of a dodo bird. He didn't, he's just a dumb king. So the story of Esther is well known and is recorded in the book bearing her name, <coughs> Hadassah, right? Here we read how the king's Ahasuerus' wife, Queen Vashti, refused the will of the king and was deposed. How Esther, Hadassah, was chosen to replace her. How evil Haman said, said to have been an Amalekite. That's interesting. Why, why, why? Because God said, they are your enemies. He was to be wiped out. And I don't think in the Torah it says, wipe all the Amalekites. God told Moses and he had to go and pray and Again, picture of the intercessor. Pray before God. Aaron and her held up and said, that was the Amalekites. They were, they were, according to the Torah, eternally cursed by God. They were to be wiped out. But somehow, there was a descendant here. And by the way, there's still descendants of the enemies of Israel. And uh, many of them are now has populated a number of the nations in the Middle East, especially directly surrounding Israel. <laughs> They're descendants from the ancient enemies of Israel. That's what this whole thing is. It's just, it's just the seed produces after its kind. That's the way God made it. <clears throat> All right. How evil Haman plotted to exterminate the Jews on account of his feral hatred of Esther's pious cousin, Mordecai. <laughs> By the way, I named after my grandfather, my mother's father, and he was Maurice Siegel. But his father came from, I think, Hungary, Lithuania. We don't know. Most likely, it was an anglicized name given to him. Uh, probably was Mordecai or Moish or Moses. Probably Mordecai. And they, they said, well, we'll just call you Maurice, you know, because it's a, uh, 
it's uh, you know anglicized but that's many many names were changed there when many of our ancestors especially those that came from russia and eastern europe and a lot of the russian names are really long you know especially the jewish ones oh my god you know uh, uh you know sitskovetsky and you know, some of them kept their names or whoever you know uh, i mean the big big long multi syllable and he says well they just shortened it like my uh wife's father who was a holocaust survivor he came his original name was mandelbaum herschel mandelbaum he his name was changed to man when he got to and many actually man is very common jewish names usually and so there was a oh. <laughs> anyway interesting has nothing to do all right How Esther learned of Haman's plot and called for a fast in order to make appeal to the king on behalf of the Jewish people and how the Jews were given permission by the king to defend themselves. Hallelujah. Notice this. Notice this. What causes the persecution and even the extermination of God's people? Government tyranny always leads when evil men get in authority there's no check that's that's why the founding fathers of america did what they did because they saw the abuse of absolute power and monarchy even in christian so-called europe and they said we've got to separate these powers and the, the the whole purpose was we didn't want we don't want a dictator and we're going to make sure we do all we can and i tell you what it took wickedness on the scale i've never and and you know years a hundred years of of trying to dismantle our system of government to put uh so till finally this fraud was uh ec corruption and crime on a level we've never seen to where our vote had no more integrity this is a uh that's very very serious that's like germany in the 30s we all all the jews said oh it can't happen here we're so civilized we've we've got it all we we're okay uh you know and yet god's got a purpose and a plan and i believe this time is unique because we are now entering into another shift of dispensation because we're coming into the day of the Lord, the Messiah. And God has a covenant purpose that he's intervening like a way it hasn't happened since maybe the Red Sea or, or Esther. Esther, this was a supernatural deliverance in spite of wicked Haman. Amen. So... <clears throat> uh, as for nasty Haman, <laughs> all his schemes boomeranged upon him, and he was hung on the very gallows originally built to hang his nemesis, Mordecai. Of course, this is all very clearly a type of our Messiah, Yeshua, of the righteous man who wouldn't compromise. He was also like Daniel in the scriptures as well. He was... He was second in command, but he was, uh, God uh, made him into a pillar to where, hallelujah, we weren't, victory eventually came because of that. God just needs a few righteous men that won't compromise, and women, of course. So here we go. Uh, the the Pur is the name of, it means lots or and it's from, uh, in, there's a scripture here, it says the lot, Proverbs 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Much is made over the fact that the book of Esther is the only book of the Tanakh, or the, the scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, that does not explicitly mention the name of God. However, the idea of God's sovereignty and Hashgacha, or divine providence, is clearly implied throughout the entire story. <clears throat> and we see uh, God behind the scenes uh, defending 
his covenant promises to his people. Praise God. We can trust God for to always do this if we are in right relationship with him. In, in light of this, Nes Nistar, or hidden miracle of the Jews' deliverance, Esther and Mordecai ordained that Purim should be observed as a day of feasting and merrymaking and of sending gifts to the poor. By the way, Purim, Purim is so named because Haman had cast lots, Purim, to determine the day on which to destroy the Jews. You've read this story. He, he, just, he said, oh, let's spin the top. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to the roulette table. Let's see, you know, let's, oh, just play with it, you know. And uh, ironically, God demonstrates that he is master over the outcome of chance and chaos throughout the entire narrative. You see that you can have hope for America right now because God's not done and he's God. Remember, he always wins and he'll do it some way you hadn't thought of. <laughs> and he gets all the glory too. And though he tarries, wait for it. You know how they say in the videos on the faith, wait for it, you know, that the, the moment will come. The, you know, the dates of Purim. For the diaspora of Purim is celebrated on the 14th of Adar, on the Hebrew calendar, the day after Haman's roll of the dice, <clears throat> indicated that the 13th of Adar, or Adar, is most propitious for the extermination of the Jews. Well, we know Satan is the one behind that. <clears throat> it is celebrated on the day after, since it was on this day, read the end of, that the, of, of, of Esther, that the Jews successfully fended off their enemies and experienced the joy of deliverance. Shushan Purim is observed in Israel a day later still, which was actually yesterday, because they're ahead of us, <coughs> on Adar 15th, for reason, oh, we're still probably in the end of Purim now in, in Israel, uh, the reason for these different dates of the festival of Purim is, of course, like every you know, that the Jews of Shushan weighed, waged war on both the thirteenth and the fourteenth. So we're celebrating today and tomorrow. Amen. Of thirteen and fourteenth of Adar, and observe the fifteenth too as a day of festivity and rejoicing. Of course, that's that's Saturday. That's Shabbat, right? Okay. But in the other provinces, the Jews waged war on the 13th and observed the 14th. Remember, it was all throughout the empire, and so some regions had different days, evidently. I don't know if that's determined in the scriptures or the Talmud or history, or, but they figured that out, and they want to make, they want to make sure it's, it's best we can, we can be accurate. So we take a little extra time. So the 14th is the day of rejoicing because we won. Praise God. We get to stay. Jews in Israel identify with the Jews of Shushan province, uh, not in China, but in uh, per ancient Persia, and hence its celebration is called Shushan, probably Shushan Purim. Over on leap years, remember, you know, every four, you, Purim is celebrated a month later, but... Um, so anyway, uh, I, Purim is a time of celebration on account of God's victory and deliverance of his people. Hooray for Mordecai. Yes, that's, it's a party. You know, in fact, uh, uh, Jews, what they'll do is they'll, they have noisemakers. You know, they have, remember those, you know, these different things and they're, they're supposed to, it's like in mockery of, of Haman, you know, and then we eat these special cookies called hamantashen. Uh, my wife brought some last night. I was going to, of course, this really is the beginning of Purim, so depending on where you are. But so, but we ended up, you know, it just didn't work to, I, I just joined in with the band and 
because that's all right. <laughs> so we had a jam session last night. Uh, I can't always, you know, I'm, I'm going to be slower on predicting what I'm going to do because honestly, uh, most of the time God changes it. So y'all just have to be flexible. And, uh, since I don't know how am I, you know, I don't want to say the wrong thing and promise you something and not do it. But I was, God just, it rose up in my heart. He said, go ahead and just, just do your Jewish night now. So he told me, so I just jumped on. And uh, as soon as he lets me finish, and I'm, <laughs> so we're going to, we're talking about Purim as well. Uh, all right. May Haman and his kind forever be foiled in their attempts to undermine those who call upon the name of the Lord God of Israel, the King of the universe. Amen. Glory to God. Purim is actually considered a minor holiday on the Jewish religious calendar, which means that it is, it is not attended with the same halalich restrictions observed on other holidays. It really is not, uh, you know, it's not in the Torah, so it's not official, whatever, feast, if you will. But the primary commandment of Purim is to recite three blessings before healing, hearing the story or the, the, the recitation of the Book of Esther, which is recited during the synagogues right now, uh, one in the evening and another in the morning. Okay, so, so it's again, it's the uh, evening and the morning. So in the, in the synagogues, especially the Orthodox, they'll read the Book of Esther. The three, now these are the three blessings. So we're going to just, and then we're going to proclaim them. And then I want to receive... Uh, receive the communion, we'll say good night. So I, I started an hour earlier, so I'm just gonna keep going. Y'all, and again, you know, <clears throat> I know it's long, but hallelujah, God's gonna bless you. I tell you what, I'd stick around. I really would. <laughs> I wanna, I, he likes it when we honor him. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ride the donkey until it finishes. And then I can say, okay, <laughs> God's, God's doing this, amen. <clears throat> Amen. So let's listen to the first of the, these three <clears throat> Hebrew blessings that are recited tonight. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kishanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu Al Mikra Megillah. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord or God, Master or King of the universe, who <coughs> sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us regarding the reading of the Megillah or the scroll of Esther. Amen. <coughs> now here's the second blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Amen. <clears throat> Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, Master of the universe, who has kept us alive. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, Master of the universe, who performed miracles for our fathers in those days at this time. <laughs> Amen. So this is the third one now. I didn't mean to read the wrong one. So here. Okay. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam shehechayanu vekiyamanu vehigianu lazman hazeh. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed art thou, Lord our God, Master of the universe, who has kept us alive and has sustained us and brought us to this season. Amen. Now that's common we say that on the different feasts and festivals because it's always a miracle that we're still here we remember that i mean we remember that uh when we got through the red sea we got through i mean we we've been preserved now now we celebrate we are preserved from the wicked Hamans of of this world sometimes they're religious people that you know, they're well-meaning Christians. Well, 
be careful for well-meaning Christians that sometimes that devil can get a hold of them too. You just got to be careful. And, uh, you know, that's why we, we're very wary as the Jewish people are very wary of Christians because we've had 2,000 years of betrayals in the name of Messiah, in the name of, of, of Jesus. Uh, and it's, it was really bad. And, uh, you know, and a lot of, like, just Americans, you just come, and I did too. I, I wasn't, I had nothing personal in my life to have any kind of grudge or anything. My father had more of that, I think. And I was, I'm sure, influenced uh, by him. But really, uh, that generation, too, that that came uh, out of World War II and what, what was done to our people, uh, that had great, uh, great consequences as well. But we've had hundreds of years of betrayals, uh, promises not kept, things that happened by so-called Christians that didn't really, they weren't born again, they didn't know Jesus, didn't let the love of God flow through them, and they dishonored uh, the the uh, uh, the covenant God made and, and didn't believe the Bible. Well, but there's been many that have. So America is different in that way. Thank God. Thank God for Protestant revival. <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, the founding fathers of George Washington, he loved the Jews. Well, you get in the Bible, you start believing it, and you start surrendering to Messiah, you're going to love the family he came from and his uh, his family, his mishpacha, his family. Jesus is a Jew, and he is a also, I mean, he's the son of David. You, you can't separate the resurrected Lord of glory from his natural family any more than God separates uh, his his people. He doesn't separate. He, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you know, anyway, I don't want to, I've got to, never. I, I'm not, I'm reading. Yes. So, at, all right. So after these blessings, the scroll of Esther is read. During the reading of the Megillah, everyone shouts, Boo! <laughs> or makes otherwise loud noises. So they'll have rattles and, you know, the, in the Purim party, you know, or the, uh, it's to, you know, boo. It basically means boo. <laughs> when the name Haman is heard, whenever you hear it, you go boo. <laughs> While they wildly cheer whenever the name Mordecai is heard. Grogers, or, yeah, noisemakers, Groggers, I don't know how you say that. And other devices are often employed on Purim. It is a wild experience and a lot of fun. It's it's probably, in some ways, the least reverent. I mean, Hanukkah has some reverence and we still celebrate, you know. But this this is really the most, supposed to be the most like a party. I mean, we're just supposed to, we're and, and these hamantashen, oh yeah, these, these cookies that I had, that's the first thing Devorah gave me this morning, and that's sweet. I it was sweet. It's like I can only eat one, but I ate one, uh, and they're good. They're like shortbread with a, but they're triangle. They're triangle shaped, like like, and uh, they have like a like a, a jam, like a raspberry. But this one did at least, and uh, like a like you like a Danish kind of in the middle, and so. At least these did. And they're called Hamantaschen, or they are called the three-cornered hat. And it's supposed, I think it's Haman's hat. He, you know, evidently wore some sort of three-cornered or triangle hat. So we, we eat his hat. <laughs> so that's a part of it. So it's really mocking, making fun in, in a sense that, hallelujah, in impossible odds, once again, God won and we won. Uh, or as we say at Passover uh, every year, <laughs> they tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. That's a you know popular kind of Jewish uh, saying. So at the end of the reading of Esther, an additional blessing regarding God's vengeance is often recited. 
So you see, God is a God of vengeance. And in the sense that ultimately payday is going to come and God will grant full redemption to his people. So there's a few customs to tell you about. Today, Purim is a happy festival with an almost carnival. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Carnival atmosphere, you know, like the carnival of Venice. It's, a, it's a, also a costume type. Uh, people come dressed up. It is time to remember that God worketh all things together for good for those who are called according to his purposes. According to, that's Romans, right? The Book of Romans. It is also a time of special parties and plays put on by children at the synagogue. If you haven't seen a little girl dressed up as Queen Esther and a little boy, Fumfer, his lines as King Ahasuerus, you are missing out on a real treat. It's it's a god. It, it's not Halloween, but it's it's God's. I mean, children love. Hey, this is fun. You can dress up in costumes and and many in the uh, in the you know in in our people in the Jewish world. We celebrate. We have you know a, a fun, and the kids are, have fun, and it's just it's it's not a real. It's a happy time. Time to remember God was faithful. Hallelujah. We survive. Let's eat, and then we are all very good at eating. <laughs> In addition to reciting the Hebrew blessings and reading the book of Esther, there are, are several customs that are associated with Purim, including a fun-filled synagogue service. I tried last night, but I we ended up just doing a jam session, and I was, you know, what, sweet home Alabama, Lord, I'm coming home to you know, today. Walt Meyer loves the 70s rock, and I kind of like Doobie Brothers and all this. It's like he'll start to play, and I, so I try to, I try to keep up. I'm getting better. We do a, we do a, a when the, the healing rooms is opening up uh, March, uh, for beginning of March, just right around the corner for us, and uh, we have a session we do on Monday afternoon. So I just, uh, I hop or it's a instrumental worship and we I just flow and jam and do the best I can to hang on you know and try to pretend I'm a a rock and roller or something and try to fit in anyway so this is a fun time uh, so these noise makers and other devices many people take are often employed, uh, employed and often there is a sumptuous oneg you know what oneg is it's a <laughs> it's sort of like snacks. You know, in Sweden, we used to, <laughs> I was, a, I was, uh, I lived in Sweden, in Uppsala, Sweden for a year in the mid 90s, 95, I think. And every time you turned around, they had, I think the Sween Swedish version of Oneg was fika. Uh, it's like coffee and, except they have coffee all the time. Coffee, coffee, coffee and pastries and little sandwiches and, you know, well, the Jewish version is oneg. So after a service, you you know they all you always eat. <laughs> so it's just different things. After the service, where you can fatten up on hamantashen. So it's a it's kind of similar to Hanukkah in that way because we eat sweets. Uh, we eat honey. We eat apples. We it's the idea of celebrating. Hallelujah! Celebrate. It's a happy time. Uh, or now, Hamantashen means Haman's ears. Uh, so I guess it meant they're making, they're they're eating the ears of it. The, so uh, these, I thought it was a hat, though. I guess not. Those delicious three-sided pastries, which I had this morning, filled with poppy seeds or other fillings, or we had a, like a raspberry filling. Some people also dress up with costumes during perm services. So that's a popular uh, synagogue. Thing. It's like fun time for kids. Eh? So the other thing is sending gifts to others. That sounds familiar, right? Normally these sorts of gifts or portions are also pre-cooked foods or pastries. Uh, that hamantashen and it's basically like cookies, you know? So uh, then the other uh, is this is common on especially joyful holidays, you know? 
is uh, the giving of a zedaka or, or charity, the giving to the poor. Uh, this is often considered a, the most significant mitzvah, good deed to do for the holiday. Zedaka is a way, or zedaka is a way of express, expressing our gratitude to God for the gift of our deliverance. It is a gift, isn't it? And then the pur Purim meal, festive, uh, Sudat Purim is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to eat special a special Purim meal. Hope I get one tonight. Usually after Minka or after the afternoon prayer service, the services on the 14th, not just prayer service. They have an evening. The Orthodox will do that three times a day, just like, you know, Daniel prayed to God three times a day in that old-fashioned way. <laughs> Pastor Jerry Zirkel used to say, well, that's actually the Jewish uh, way of, I mean, the real, the real uh, serious ones. They, they have, they do it three times a day, and it's a very serious, uh, not serious, but it's a holy thing. And what I marvel at is not so, it's not so much oh I gotta obey the rules. There are some like that, just like there are Christians like that, legalistic and, like, and there's no but there's some that are just they glow. They're just holy people. They're they're like Ezra. I mean, and as far as they know, they're doing all they can to serve the Lord and they're speaking the word. They're speaking the scriptures and they are sanctifying God. That's setting apart. That's a that's a very special thing. And what another thing I marveled at in the prayer services, uh, when I learned more about that uh, some years ago now, I still don't know much. I know very little. Forgive me, but uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, it's how much of the word of God is being spoken. It's just it's ninety percent seem like scripture, and the rest are very, uh, very. Uh, I mean. They're, they're like commentary, it, 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 like prayers that are really just soaked in, in the holiness of God. And, and so that's contagious. That'll rub off on you. Even if you're just a, hallelujah, you're just coming in from the cold, don't know what this is. And, uh, and yet you'll feel that Ruach HaKodesh come because God always, he says, yeah, watch over my word before me. When God's word, even if it's the first covenant or Psalms, or whatever, a lot of Psalms are in the prayers, a lot in the recited daily Jewish prayers, in the Siddurs. Uh, the Siddur is the daily prayer uh, uh, book, basically. It's, it's just, I mean, it's just the Bible, and you're praying it. So God always honors his word. Oh, yes, he does. It has supernatural power. So, anyway. Uh, many children dress up in elaborate masks and costumes for the sufferers. Like other holidays, we light Yom Tov candles and recite Kiddush before partaking of the meal. Y'all have to forgive me. I don't have the candles yet. I haven't gotten that far. I'm learning, and, we, and I'm discerning also how to rightly divide... What do you want me to do, Lord? And and because uh, it's easy to... It, this The restoration of the message of Israel in the church is, is like walking down a narrow bridge. There is a stream of Messianic Judaism, or a path, I should say, a narrow path, and there's big ditches on both sides. And so you have to stay within certain certain boundaries so that because it's very easy to slip off the road into the ditch if you will or the bridge you know it's like a narrow bridge that and well why is it important because 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 god is restoring <laughs> and he's faithful to his every word of promise and you know what us blood washed and I, I say we on both sides. I'm in the middle of this. I, I didn't ask to be put in the middle. God just did it. Uh, <clears throat> and <laughs> as much as we Gentile blood-washed uh, believers, Christians, the, uh, as much as we think we're the only game in town, and we think we have to tell the Jews, well, you, be 
you receive my Jesus, then you can then you can be born again. You can be in part of our deal. You can receive salvation. That's true. You, we all have to. When you come that way, that's the door. There's no other door. But <laughs> actually, God turns that upside down. And uh, you've got to get a revelation of, you know, <laughs> and this is the saying. I this uh, The Jews didn't get into the church's deal. The church got into the Jews' deal. In other words, you were included. You were the outsider. You had nothing. You weren't the one with a covenant. <laughs> We've been here. <laughs> and it's a very real covenant still. It's not. It's it's a it's a it's a different covenant, but it is still in effect. And God is fulfilling both covenants. And I like that. You know, I really didn't hear that until I heard Kenneth Copeland talk about it. I said, wow, well, that's pretty good for a Texan, you know, just, you know, I mean, he's got a revelation. He understands, <laughs> he understands what he says, the old covenant, new covenant, he called it first covenant, second covenant. That's true. It doesn't mean that the, the and it is a new covenant and it is, uh, it is the one we are to live in and it's the fullness, yes, in Messiah. But we have a tendency, because of so many hundreds of years of, uh, of separation to try to uh, replace Israel by the church. And I mean, they've done everything they could. The Christian world, for hundreds of years, has done all they could, literally, to wipe Jews off the face of the earth. They've done the same thing. Why? Because they said, well, now we have the, we're the ones. Well, yes and no, you're not the ones. You're not the family of Abraham. Not literally, you are spiritually. You are, you are, so who's the adopted? Who's the firstborn? And that's, and I had an argument, not argument, but I had a, a, a very gentle, friendly, if you will, uh, disagreement with a pastor not too long ago over this. He said, there's just one seed. It's this, It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's it. Everything else is swallowed up. I said, well, you want to just tear out the Bible and throw it out? Does, well, it doesn't apply to us anymore. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. But all, and I said, wait a minute. It's a new creation. Yes, I believe that more than you do, actually. I'm a new creation. I, 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 live in E.W. Kenyon for years. I know exactly what that is. And I believe it 100%. I'm more that way than you are. However, uh, God put me in a unique spot uh, because I have a job to do. I have to hold a flag up saying, uh, excuse me. God says, uh, what about the older brother? <laughs> God loves the older brother and the younger brother. Or, as Paul puts it, the natural born or the, the firstborn son and the adopted. That's the great, that's what Paul was trying to get through us, that uh, this is, there's two parts of the family. Does that mean that there's a redemption through the old? No. The redeemer, the redemption comes through the redeemer. But, so you've got to rightly divide this. And if you do, why am I doing that? Well, why do you spend all that time? Well, just just forget it. Just just be a you know, just be a, a, a you know Christian. Just you know, okay. I tried, I tried. I came into this kicking and screaming. <laughs> God would, He did this to me. It's His fault. Talk to Him about it. I just work here. But anyway, no. But this is what happened. What God is saying is. I'm restoring the eternal kingdom of God on earth through the family, the natural seed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're here to stay. We're not going away. You're going to have to get used to it. Uh, so you better just pray. <laughs> and be gay, but not in the, the new meaning of the word. You need to be 
gay in the original meaning of the word, happy and celebrating and innocent. Glory to God. That's a wonderful word. It was corrupted. What a terrible thing it happened to that three-letter word. Happy and gay was a wonderful thing. <laughs> How did I get over there? So, you know, you're going to have to accept that God has turned his attention not to the, I mean, yes, the prodigal, absolutely. The prodigal son is a parable uh, that you can turn on its head and it has equal application. What I mean is the natural firstborn was the dutiful religious son that did everything right, but what? He didn't have a revelation of the love of the father and his inheritance and uh, the uh, uh, the intimacy. Well, well, the the re re rebel, the younger son, says, "Give me all you have. Give. I want all this coming to me." And then he went to <laughs> he went to Las Vegas and lost it all and whatever. You know, he riotous living, <laughs> uh, women and whatever. So. He winds up, as you always will do, if you are in rebellion, you'll wind up in the pig pen. You'll wind up in uh, the curse of poverty. You will be in trouble. And there was a famine that came. Well, you get into the, I mean, the realm of the darkness right now, there's there's spiritual famine and a lot of, a lot of it's, there's judgment. You get out from under that, that, that curse will eat your lunch and pop your brown paper bag too. That's what happened. Why? Well, just give me what's coming to me. This is my inheritance. Notice he received. Why? Because he knew. He knew. And he could take it. So he took it. That's faith in a way. But he was, he was, he says, I'm a, he got a revelation. I'm worthless. I can't, I can't earn this thing. I can't do it. But, Maybe, Lord, make me a slave. In other words, I'll work for you, for even your slaves get more than getting corn corn cobs in the pig pen. You know, it's a bad place to be as a Jewish boy, huh? So <clears throat> what happens? Now we're so quick to say, yes, God is forever in love with the prodigal. Yeah. What about the dutiful religious uh lost <laughs> older brother who actually has the greater inheritance. The firstborn has a double portion. <laughs> in the, uh, in, especially in, that, in the Jewish world, in that, in biblical times. <clears throat> so the firstborn actually has, maybe he didn't know it, he didn't, well, all that I have is yours. He didn't know that, but he learned that. I believe he learned that. Well, God says, you know, and yes, oh, he was jealous. They made Mary. Well, you killed the fatted calf. Well, I would have done that for you any time. He, I think the father has more than one fatted calf. <laughs> In fact, I know he does. The cattle on a thousand hills, hills are his. <laughs> you, get a, you can get a fatted calf any time. You're a son that comes up to the son and daughter of God. Come up to the table of God and feast. You don't have to go out in the fields and earn it. Well, that's religion. Well, get. let me tell you something. Yeah, you're quick to say Jews are all bound up and in religion and look at them. And, of course, the J Jewish leaders in Jesus' day were enemies of the Messiah at that time. They He came unto his own, his own received him not, but <laughs> for those who did. So there were some that did. I did. I'm here. Well, we'll make an exception for you. You've become a good Baptist, Southern Baptist, Maybe we'll let you into our church. <laughs> yeah, forget all that. Like uh, that, uh, that minister evangelist said to me one time, take that beanie off if you want to play in my services. Uh, that's like slapping, that's like slapping the father in the face. Didn't even know it. Well, that's, there you go. There's a crude, blood-washed Gentile prodigal son who just has the grace of God, doesn't even know it, and he's operating in a whole lot of power and giftings, but didn't know this. Well, we're all, we're all that way. We all wind up in some places, we're all in the pig pen in this life. <laughs> so anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that parable 
can be turned on its head. And I'm saying, look, the real subject of that parable was the firstborn, not the prodigal. The prodigal, yes, the father saw him and ran, ran the only time God ran. Yes! But what about the old? God, God loves the older brother, too. Is he going to restore that? Well, this is what's happened in history. We started out first century church, right? What? All Jews. First 10 chapters of Acts. Not one, as a friend of mine says, not one swine-eating Gentile in them. <laughs> I don't like to say that anymore because that's in, that can be taken wrong. And so I don't want to insult. So, uh, in other words, there's no, there wasn't one. I mean, Peter, and they had to have a whole council, Acts chapter 15. I mean, they had to have a, a G7 summit, you know. I mean, what do we do? Why? Acts 10. What happened? Just God opens up the entire, all the nations and said, I've cleansed all of them in my blood. What? So they have to have a whole, what do we do? This is the question. What do we do about these Gentiles that are getting born again and receiving, they receiving the same Holy Spirit as we? What do we do? Well, that was what the big, do we make them Jews? Do we put them under the law? Do we circumcise them? Do we make them keep all these crazy, uh, not crazy, but you know, these, these legalistic things? And the whole point Paul made uh, was, uh, of course, you have to remember, God loves to turn the tables. He turned him upside down and inside out. He was the Jewish uh, Hebrew. The Hebrews probably in line to be the next Kohen Gadol, high priest, under Gamaliel. He was a scholar. He was righteous. He was everything. I mean, he was the... He was the uh, primo Jew, okay? Well, and then he gets an experience on the road to Damascus and there's one, that same, bless his heart, same man that said that thing about the beanie when hopefully he learned his lesson by now, bless his heart, I don't mind. But uh, I don't want to tell you who he is, none of your business, it's all right, God bless him. Shouldn't have said that probably. Well, so he goes, road to Damascus, what happens to him? God hit him so hard, knocked him off his high horse. Jesus said, I am, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> so he takes his body as himself. Any, we're part of him. What, what are you doing, Paul? And Paul has the Damascus Road experience and he completely turns around and he becomes... The same thing he was trying. He's killing the Christians. He's dragging them off the prison. And he was holding the coats of those that were stoning Stephen, the first martyr. I mean, he was, uh, he in his zeal, he was so zealous. Well, God just turned him around like that. Suddenly he becomes, what did, what did God call him to do? Go to the barbarians. <laughs> You know, Attila the Hun or whatever. Go to the Gentiles. He was called, he called himself the apostle of to the Gentiles. Well, Peter was called what? To the apostle to uh, the Jews. And he was the uneducated fisherman. So they're having some struggles because this transition time. What do we do with these born again, new creation, adopted children that just suddenly... What, they just get in our deal, they get everything, and didn't have to do a thing to do it. Well, that's exactly like the older son, isn't it? Well, that guess what? God has grace for the older son, and God always wins. And so I want to tell you a revelation. Both sons are going to make it. <laughs> Hallelujah. I guarantee you. God always wins. He has the victory. So anyway, so we celebrate this. God is bringing the two covenant peoples together, and exactly how that will be uh, realized in the Olam Haba, the world to come, we don't have enough information. We have clues. We have 
certain things that we know. And uh, and you, we don't really know. The, it's a mystery. What is it? One new man. You're joined and yet you're distinct. That was Paul's revelation. The wall of separation has been removed. And God has, he's my, both sons, both sons are coming in by grace. Both of them. And both of us have to accept each other. So the irony here, another uh, so, you know, 2,000 years later, here we are, 1967, charismatic movement begins. Uh, Jerusalem suddenly given back to Israel. Uh, dancing in the street. This is a miracle, six-day war. And then what does God do? <laughs> he didn't wait for anybody in the church. He didn't ask anybody. You know what he did? He just started visiting Jewish teenagers and secular families. Some of them were, I mean, just like they are today. They go to India to find themselves and some guru. They're off into some crazy thing. Why? They're hungry. They're spiritually hungry. They don't know God from a hole in the wall. They're, but they have a covenant. <laughs> so God, God comes and visits them all. Not all, but thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews that never heard the gospel suddenly hear, wow, man, Jesus, I'm a Jesus freak. Get in my Volkswagen Beetle and I'll <laughs> far out. <laughs> and they're hippies and, and they come to Jesus all over the place. And suddenly they wake up and say, wait a minute, I'm Jewish. And then their families freak out. Why? Hundreds and hundreds of years of torture and betrayal in the name of Jesus to our people. Well, <laughs> that's a problem. But here we are. Like, well, I don't go to church. My father, the only thing he really, he you could be anything. You could believe in pink elephants that fly. It didn't matter. I mean, I how it didn't matter if you believe you worship toad frogs. He says, oh, that's wonderful for you. I, if it makes you happy, it gives you a better life. It, you help people and, you know, this and that and the other. Well, there's only one thing that he hated and got so angry, he'd blow his top over. Uh, and there were lang language came out of him that I never heard any other time until he heard somebody somewhere say Jesus or the name of Jesus or the or anything to do with uh, anything close to the scriptures. And of course, I never heard it. He just, he'd go into a tirade. And, you know, well, how did I get here? I don't know. Nanny Buell, you know, whatever. Well, this happened to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of secular Jewish teenagers at that time. Why? God started calling the firstborn back. That's what he did. And many of them were backslid. You know, they, they became, they, we were more lost than the, the at least the, hey, at least the, the, the Christian world had somebody's great aunt or grandma or grandfather, somebody's praying somewhere. I mean, you know, somebody pray for you and uh, you'll at least have a chance, you know. <laughs> but, no. Hey, my family was blown to smithereens. My dad was married five times. And we, I don't think we even, I mean, nobody speaks to each other. I, and he's gone now, but, and all my moms and whatever, nearly. So, uh, no family. The only family I have really is the family of God. It's enough. That's enough. So why do we celebrate Purim? <laughs> God, against impossible odds, we will fulfill our destiny. As a people, the Jewish people, we're going to make it. I don't care if you're in the pig pen, in rebellion, uh, you lost it all, or you're just the dutiful, uh, legalistic, didn't depart from the father's house. Uh, he served him. He did his best. He just got all... We both have to come to a revelation. 
I will have the Father and his love. And let me tell you something else. The two of us are going to have to start learning how to get along. And that requires something called humility. That means, that means we honor one another. Esteem others better than yourself. And this is the granddaddy of all rifts. If you want to know the greatest, uh, it wasn't the Catholic and the Protestant. That's probably what caused that rift in the church in history. It was this one, Jew church. People of God, God's redeem, redeeming us for a purpose. And uh, I got news for you, too. Uh, you're not going to get rid of, the church is not going to usurp the place of Israel anymore than Israel will replace. You have, we have it, but we have a destiny in covenant. And that covenant, you can't do anything about it. You're just going to have to learn and you have to understand that all of the Bible's promises are true. Will that mean you just get saved? No, no, no. Not every Jew will be saved any more than every Gentile will be saved. I mean, there's a lot of both that split hell wide open. Sure, it's terrible. But whosoever call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so this is a first fruits of the spiritual harvest of the elder son that was also equally estranged and from the father. Neither of them knew, knew him, really. Religious Christians, religious Jews, didn't know God from a hole in the wall. Well, Purim is showing that against impossible odds, even God can raise up a Cyrus. He can raise up a, I mean, he'll do, he'll take, he, he'll have a Mordecai. He'll always have a remnant. And remember, what I, my favorite thing about God is he always wins. So this Purim received the victory. <laughs> victory of the, the Lord. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God who always gives us the victory, it causes us to triumph in the Messiah, Yeshua. Well, anyway. Well, now, we're, I'm not going to do that, but it says, according to the Talmud, uh, you should drink so much wine during the meal that you can no longer coherently know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mordecai. <laughs> uh, when did you hear somebody tell you to do that before? But I don't drink because it's not good for me. Not anymore. I, and this is sometimes this, this sort of custom. A lot of Jews drink. Uh, this is sometimes called the Ad Lo Yada. Until you don't know. <laughs> Needless to say, this tradition is not a requirement. And is in fact not recommended <laughs> for the holiday celebration. I guarantee you though. You know, the war used to tell stories of, of you know, her, the, the shul where she attended was amazing. I mean, they had some great, uh, great rabbis, men of God, sat under uh, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach. And, well, <laughs> during the time when she, well, so it was just the women and the men are, are separated, but the men, after, after, especially on Shabbat, you know what they do? There's a drink called Slivovitz. And it's basically like vodka. I mean, very high proof, I think vodka. Some, you know, basically a very, um, very potent hard liquor, okay? And I think it's clear. But that's, that just, they put it away, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, oh, they just sit at the table and they work. I mean, you know, they're just as human. We're all in this. <laughs> but, so... All right. I'm going to read one more paragraph and then I have to say good night. Thank you for, y'all, some of you stuck with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeshua and Purim. Here we go. Did Yeshua, Jesus, celebrate Purim? It is written in John chapter 5 that he was in Jerusalem 
for an unnamed feast, but scholars have questioned which feast it was. Some have rejected the idea that this was Purim because it was is considered a minor feast and not one of the Shalos Regalim or the three pilgrimage, pilgrimage festivals. Again, those three are in the Torah and they're they're the big the three big pillars, you know. However, we know that Yeshua, Jesus, celebrated Hanukkah. I think most likely it was probably Hanukkah in this reference, which is also another minor minor feast. And so a priori it, that it is not a worthy objection. According to Lambert's Dolphin's research on this question, chronologically, the only feast that John could be referring to is Purim, since it is said to have fallen on Shabbat, John 5, 9. But the only feast that occurs occurred on Shabbat between the years of 25 through 35 CE or AD, or no, that's BCE, that's, that's before, I think, no, I don't know, CE, that's, I guess it's AD, actually, was in fact, of course, that's when Jesus was alive, so, was in fact uh, Purim in the year 28. But why was it referred to as an unnamed feast? Perhaps the Spirit of God intentionally left out the name of the feast because the name of the Lord was likewise deliberately left out of the book of Esther. I think one of the reasons why the the name of God doesn't appear uh, in one, these are one of the five scrolls, the holy scrolls, you know, uh, the, the smaller history, or whatever, smaller books. Uh, the reason is because God was hidden and yet he was very much there. In the world of Esther, it was like the Democrats were in power, you know, <laughs> or it was the ungodly. This was this was a time when uh, the holy government, if you will, under the old covenant, Israel was not. There was. It says like in the book of Judges, and there was no king in Israel. There was no leader, and the people did what. They did. In other words, it was not. It was a, a, a situation of the dispersion. It was a situation where uh, God had to invade a, a Gentile empire and rule like he did with Daniel. He, Daniel stood and Nebuchadnezzar, God's will was still done because of Daniel. Well, because of Mordecai, I think he had the same prophetic anointing like Mordecai, just unyielding, powerful man, wise, was able to function in the Gentile world in such a way that he never lost his identity, but he was able to, he was a very, very good, he ended up, always ended up on the top, always. He, no matter what happened, or who was overcome, or who was, whole empires rise and fall, and there's Jan, there's Daniel. He's still there. And he says, I serve your father. I serve your grandfather. I serve, you know. Uh, and all of that was because God needed. Well, this is the situation in America right now. We have uh, actually a tremendous, tremendous. Uh, uh, I know you don't see it right now, but there is. You talk about awakening and revival. It's here. There's a lot of Christians, and I'll say this too, God is, hasn't forgotten the Jewish world. There's a whole lot in that world. There are those that listen to me. One of the reasons why I, I speak in both worlds is, and, and is because I am called to be a bridge. And of course, that's the hardest thing, because as you know, <coughs> the hardest thing about being a bridge is Everybody walks over you to get to the other side. <laughs> so, but that's all right. Hallelujah, I got grace. I got grace for that. You have an app for that? I have grace for that. <laughs> I have grace for that. All right, I went on a super long time, and but we were able to, at least I was able to give you um, some of this wonderful commentary and, and uh, give you a new appreciation, if you can, during 
in the next two days read the book of Esther. It's not long. It's only 10 chapters, I think, right? And let God show you, even when we're strangers in a strange land, and you don't see God. He doesn't appear. He doesn't, he's not, he's not in the, it's like, no, where is the God of Israel's hidden, and yet he's, you can't, he, he, he never forget you. He never, he, he keeps covenant. He says, even if you're scattered to the ends of the earth, you've done everything wrong, and you wind up in the pig pen of life, like the, I mean, whether you're Jew or Gentile, God says, even there, if you call upon me, I will remember that's a part of Deuteronomy 28, too, I think. it's. I'll bring you back. I'll be a refuge. I'll be a little tent. I'll be a, a mishkan. I'll be a... I will be a refuge for you, even in the lands of dispersion, exile. Even in exile, I'll be a little sanctuary for you. And that's what the... Uh, that's what we celebrate in the Feast of Booths, or the... Uh, the we. We know even in these temporary dwellings uh, that we were just we're passing through, God says, I, I'm, I'm going to come in, I'm going to come into that tent with you and I'll just be with you. And the Holy One of Israel, <laughs> he's hidden in all kinds of places. You can't see him. You can't say his name, but guess what? <laughs> he's there and he's all through the book of Esther and he's right now in america in a way that you you I, I just can't wait i mean i do i'm waiting but i just this is going to be an awesome thing how is god going to do this oh it's and you know he's up there laughing because he says i know what i'm going to do well you hadn't done it it's 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 a whole march <laughs> well why are you having a coronary well i refused i decided i'm not going to have that <laughs> no that wasn't to do with that as other reasons but uh, why? Why are you so, what, you think God needs your help? Is, does he need you to, for, you know, <laughs> does he need the Democratic Party? Does he need that? Does he, we well, yeah, don't need anything. And he's going to get all the glory and he'll still win even now. That's what I see in part of, okay. And I went a long time probably record. I think this is the longest I've ever been on. I came on at five o'clock and that's what happens when you pray in tongues. I've doubled and tripled my tongues, the tongues. I pray in the spirit and hallelujah. I've been doing like six hours and then it just, boy, last two service. I mean, this, this is like, it's like the old days when I floated through on fire or ran through on fire for 10 years, didn't even remember, I don't, shh. and I'm back, <laughs> in a be and better now. All right, well, listen, let me bless you. Oh, we're gonna, shoot. Well, all right, I'm gonna take communion here, and I didn't set it up, but let's do that, because, and I, I wanna get back into our services, and I've gotten a little, little sidetrack. So y'all pray for me that I have some order here. So I don't just this thing about Pentecostal you get into the spirit and I tell you what, he'll he'll do something different than you thought you would do a minute ago. Huh. That's all right. Some of you still love me. You're with me, I know. And uh I am going to since I don't have a cup Y'all have to forgive me. I'm going to use my, <laughs> oh, Lord, I didn't, I didn't get it tonight. So uh, my cranberry juice, I'm going to have used that. So I'm still going to bless it. So y'all just, let's just ask God's blessing here. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit 
of the vine. <laughs> we have to use faith with this one today. Okay, hallelujah. So, Yeshua the night he was betrayed, took the matzah and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. You show my death and, of course, resurrection. And you show my death till I come. And out of his death comes forth eternal life, healing, and wholeness, shalom, for your entire being. Receive healing from the top of your head to the soles of your feet in Yeshua's mighty name, and receive the victory of Purim tonight. Hallelujah. May every Haman in your life be destroyed and never rise up again. Amen. May he be executed on the very gallows he constructed to hang you. May God turn around, turn around every trap and plot of the enemy and cause victory to come forth even out of the very jaws of defeat. That's our God. Praise the Lord. Receive. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I love you, Lord. You're so wonderful. I praise you. I give thanks to you. Bless all those that are Hung on with me all this time. Praise the Lord. Bless those that are watching at another time too. Yeshua took the cup. <laughs> I don't think it was a mason jar filled with cranberry juice, but I'm going to have a little cranberry <laughs> He took the cup of Passover wine, and he took it and he lifted it up. Oh, I feel the glory of God. The Lord says, I don't mind. I'll, I'll bless it too. <laughs> I said, good. Okay. Okay, no lightning bolts here. Okay, fine. Praise God. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Pour it out for you for the remission and forgiveness of sin, of your sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, let heaven and earth worship him. Hail King Jesus, our Messiah. Mm. Glory to God. So he says, drink, drink this in my name. You show my death till I come. And Lord, we thank you for forgiving us of all of our sins, cleansing us, washing us in your precious blood. And we thank you for the great blessing of the new covenant. And we, according to Psalm 103, we forget not all your benefits. Glory to God. You heal all our diseases. You forgive all our sins. You give us long life. You've redeemed us from poverty. You've redeemed us from every curse that the blessing of Abraham can come on us, both Jew and Gentile, through the blood of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Glory to God. Let every knee bow, let every tongue confess that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is Lord to the glory of God the Father forever. Amen. Drink. Mm. Praise the Lord. I was thirsty too. Huh. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I hope you're blessed tonight. Got something out of it. Oh, I forgot. I... <laughs> I just look what I got. My precious Devorah ordered me <laughs> uh, this, which is the school I went to in Philadelphia. So there's sort of two schools, and somehow God put me in both. I don't. Anyway, this is a Curtis Institute 
the music t-shirt. So I got one for both now. So I guess God's saying, you don't have to hide that. It's okay. I said, all right, well, whatever. I, the greatest musical experiences, I think, as a student, as far as just tamer music and was was there in Philadelphia, so thank you, Lord. We just thank God for all the blessings. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? All right. Well, let me let me. Uh, uh, I'm gonna just. I like to end, especially on this Purim tonight. But I want to end with the ironic uh, blessing, and also, if I remember correctly, I think we're up to Philippians. Uh, the book, uh, the letter of Philippians to uh, the benediction or the end of Paul's blessing to the Philippians. So let's, uh, I'm going to do both. So hold on. I love the letter to the Philippians. It's amazing. All right. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> All right, there we go. I'm going to, all right. So, from Numbers chapter 6. Hallelujah. What qualifies me? The blood of Yeshua qualifies me as a, as a, in the spirit, but I actually am a Levite on my mother's side. So, somehow that happened. All right, so here you go. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord give you his shalom peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. May the blessing of God come upon you and overtake you in every area of your life. And Paul writes here, um, here we go. I, I just love it from, I know it's, uh, yeah. I love this promise that God gives to his partners. This is a partner letter. <laughs> it was those that were covenant with him. He had started the church in, uh, in Philippi and uh, he had won them to the Lord. They were born again. They were, uh, and, um, he and they it was basically a thank you note <laughs> especially the fourth chapter the last chapter is thank you for your your gift thank you for your offering and your your support it was a i mean there's a lot more to it than that but he was in prison but they had contributed and 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 helped him and the works that he was connected to so that's what this was so he's able to say this uh, because he says it actually before the promise in verse 19. Look at this. <clears throat> uh, verse 16 says, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once again unto my necessity. In other words, you gave. He, they gave financially to him. They helped him. They supported him. Not because I desire a gift. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> in other words, he's saying, I'm not trying to get money out of you. Of course not. Not because I desire a gift, but I, but this is what he desires. And that, by the way, this is one of the mark of, of, of true, uh, I mean, true uh, minister or whatever you want to say, leader, someone that you, you can trust. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. This is, this is what activates uh, this supernatural fruit with, which also manifests in the realm of prosperity. All right. Uh, but I have all. Now look at this. He's in prison. He's been through the, probably from the worst. Game, but he says, but I have all. And yet he did. Because why? But I have all and abound. Thank you, he's saying. I am full. Now look. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, Things, support, finances. This is a thank you note, if you will, because they were so generous. 
uh, for the things which were sent from you. Now it says, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice. Remember how I talked about how you're giving. Your giving has to be like the the burnt offerings and the new, it's not just, I mean, it's obeying God, but then worship God with the first fruits of all your increase. The Bible says, so shall your barns be filled. That means there's extra. You have to put it in a barn. Barns be filled with plenty. Your presses shall burst out. In other words, with with new wine, you're going to have, you, 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 you won't be able to contain it. God says, I don't care how big your container, get bigger containers because you're going to have, get as many as you can because I I'll fill them until there is no more. Just like, I mean, he'll do it. He'll do it. Hallelujah. Especially when you get to where you, that's, well, that's my father. <laughs> yes. You get a knowledge of, of who you really are, your inheritance. This is not something you earn. It just came because you were born into the, born into the family. <laughs> That's all. It's just you're a joint heir. You you, you're an heir of God. What do you think of that? Do you think? Don't you think that's amazing? I don't know why I'm talking. Anyway, here we go. It's a when you give, it transfers. When you worship God with your giving, what happens is when it's done in the right spirit and you're doing it in covenant, like. They did, like Epaphroditus did, and he brought this gift from the Philippians to him, which he needed right then. And, it's, and, and, and guess what? He, his needs were met. He says, now listen, he says, I, he said before, I have all in a bound. So he, God, of course, received. God, of course, took care of him, but he took care of more than just that. And God releases your inheritance out of heaven. So now that's what he says here. That's the that's the context of verse 19. Don't take this verse out of context. Verse 19 is a promise. And we all of us want to take this promise. But my God. And it's a wonderful promise. But but I don't I'm looking at the the lack or whatever pressure or whatever. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory, his riches in glory, by the Messiah Yeshua, by Christ Jesus, all comes through that covenant. But uh, notice, Paul said, I'm given authority, I can pray, and God's, God's going to, why? Because you have, you, have, you have done what the Lord asked. He said, give shall be given. That's how, the more than enough comes. That's how the barns get full. That's how the presses burst forth. You know, that that's where uh, you're able, why do you want more than enough? So I can build more barns? No. <laughs> what do I do with all that? Well, the problem with that man in the parable that Jesus talked about, where shall I put my goods and riches? I have, you know, I say, soul, you got it made in the shade, drinking cool lemonade, just just build more barns and I'll just take ease, eat, be merry, you know. Well, the problem is <laughs> that's not the purpose for the more than enough. The purpose of the more than enough is so you can help uh, uh, those remember the poor. Remember, the, see, it's, and here's a good indicator. Honestly, I think it's better, and I didn't think this before. It was Sister Gwen Shaw that said this to me, and I told you about, she said, my whole life, I've lived daily in dependence upon God. And then she says, you know, here in Engletal, which was her, is her, still there in Arkansas, it's a, like a property there, beautiful, you know, and many, she supported many, I mean, the handmaids and servants that she had, and now it's called the outpouring, beautiful. But anyway, she's gone on to be with the Lord, but she said, the money, now she said, the money comes in every month and it goes out every month. But it never stops. <laughs> she said. Uh, and I would, I don't want it any other way. She says, I don't want it any other way. And I said, wow. 
Now that's a really prosperous person. That is, you talk about prosperity. That is, that, why? Because that's the way Jesus was. He always had more than enough. And then see, you're able to give and help others. She was helping probably, oh gosh, at least she'd have about 20 to 50 people there all the time. That was not in the heyday either. It was, uh, now it's less, but, but she'd support, she supported a lot. She took care of, and, and then there was all the gifts and the giving nobody heard about. Well, that's where the increase goes. See, the whole purpose of when God can trust you and it flows through you, and then you, you had, well, I, at the beginning of the month, I had this amazing gift and whoosh, Mrs. Sklar <laughs> paid the bills and whatever. And where did it all go? Well, he meets our needs. How? According to his riches and glory. That's heaven's economy, not earth. And I tell you, you get into this realm, you're going to make it. More than make it. You'll do well even Isaac sowed in famine and he received. Now, I'm not giving you an offering so that I can, you know, again, uh, he says not because I desire a gift. This is how you activate this realm of fruit. Fruit. Fruit that what abounds to your account. Fruit is the harvest. Fruit is the, is the abundance. When you have, uh, we have a lemon tree <laughs> called a Meyer lemon tree. I don't, uh, anyway, but they're very special. And, and I have, actually I have some, um, I have some, Devorah uh, made these uh, uh, out of lemons, the whole thing puts it in the blender and then <laughs> pulp and all and, and makes a, and just uh, adds water. And, but they're not bitter, it's amazing. Well, our little tree, for some reason, somebody did something right before we came along. <laughs> and the previous uh, oh, uh, owners of the house, they, they he, uh, this lemon tree in this climate here, this little bush just produces enormous amount of big, juicy, sweet, if you will, almost sweet lemons. And uh, so, hallelujah, God wants you to have so much fruit on your tree. <laughs> so why? So that er, you, can, you can feed a lot of people that way. You can, your increase supplies. And that's the way this whole thing, God designed it to work. Anyway, so here is the benediction. Now, he says, I have authority, I'm praying, and I, have, I am blessing you with that supply coming out of heaven because you have activated that through partnership, through covenant, through your offerings of sweet savor. See, all that, all of the context of that is, has to do with giving and receiving. And you got to learn how to do that. And it needs to be taught more. And a lot of times preachers get get nervous about it and ministers or whatever. They, they don't talk about it because they don't, oh, well, you know, people misunderstand. Oh, you're talking about money again. No. What this is is opening the avenue of supply from heaven. See, that's where it comes from. It's opening up and increasing your capacity to receive. It all comes out of that unseen realm. You, this is the source. It's not people. It's not job. It's a God is our source. And this is really true. And you've got to, you know what? We need to hear that. Why? Because faith comes in any subject by hearing. You, we need to, you know, <clears throat> you, we just need to hear it. I need to hear it. It helps me. Amen. And I had no intention of talking about finances or offerings, but that's, this chapter is chock full of that. I meditated it so long until the revelation just in me. I can't read it without stopping and, and plucking some fruit off the tree. <laughs> Amen. Here we go. All right. Now, now, <laughs> now may, now unto God and our, and our Father, 
<clears throat> interesting that he says God and our Father. Well, God is one, but he exists, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons. It's a mystery, but there's, there's different realms of, and God's dealing with man, how we receive the grace of God. So he's saying, now unto God <clears throat> and our Father, <clears throat> he's talking about who? Messiah. This time he names him first because he says he's going to supply all my needs because he just said by Christ Jesus. So he says now unto God. Well, that's he's God. <laughs> and our Father. Interesting, huh? Never saw that before, including me. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. Be glory how? Why? When is God glorified? When you give and receive and produce fruit and have more than enough and prosper, it brings glory to God forever and ever. Now unto him. Now you got to be under the spout where the glory pours out. You have to be under, under that blessing or in him or by him in the proper place. And right now we have to be sure we are in that place in that place hallelujah all right well bless you now i'll be praying for you and i'll lift your names up to the lord uh probably tomorrow evening because i go to bed earlier these days uh and then i well i'm not sure about tomorrow so you all just have to see i i i mean <laughs> i don't know what i'm supposed to do right now so i just got to tonight straight and i all right and uh, uh, praise God. You can go to sklarministries.com and there's a PayPal donation button there. And a number of you recently have said you feel more comfortable <clears throat> with another way of, of giving or through uh, the mail. And what I do is I will, if you need my address, I'll give it to you, but I won't give it publicly. So you have to write me a note or some other way or you can talk to Devorah if you want some other way of doing it and thank you for helping us oh my that was a long one okay thank you and I'll see you real soon shalom shalom good night sleep well thanks for thanks for joining me this evening happy Purim <laughs>